What a great facility. I'm Kurt Spaulding. I'm the regional administrator of EPA, uh, appointed a little over a year and a half ago. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with all of you today, and I'm especially pleased to be in this wonderful facility. Before I do anything else, I want to thank the folks who, put, who have been putting this together. I know some of you have been here for the other workshops, but uh, the team that's put this together, I, I want to acknowledge the staff at EPA and the facilitation and all, that, all involved. It's, uh, it, it's probably one of the best things I've ever seen in all the work I've done, uh, nearly 20 years of environmental work this kind of engagement process. I think this is some of the best that's ever been done in the country and I'm, I'm very proud of it. I also want to thank all of you for coming. I know some of you have been to a couple of these. This may be your first night. I'm going to go over some slides, uh, presuming that you haven't been here, but if, but if I have, if you have been, I apologize for the repetition. But um, this is only as good as the work and the education you all put into it. Um, we feel very strongly, and my boss especially feels strongly, my boss is Lisa Jackson, the Administrator of EPA. She says a couple things to us as regional administrators is that we are, we are obliged to reach out to community and engage community in constructive conversation around tough issues that we have to deal with. And I, so I'm very, very pleased you could come. You know, the only way that works is community comes out. So again, thank you. Um, I'm going to say a few things before I get into the slides uh, that really re speak to speak to my responsibilities as as administrator of uh, regional administrator of EPA. Um, you know, I, I came to work and the great staff at EPA, my deputy Ira Layton, um, organized a book for me to look at. And in the very front of the book was this issue. The scale of this issue was something that was explained to me very early on, the scope of the concern, the, the kinds of challenging issues that are at play here. So I want you to know that right out of the gate, um, my, my coming to the office of, of EPA and, and taking on the leadership of, of Region 1, um, this has always been a primary issue for, for all the staff at EPA, not just the staff who are working at it here, but a lot of people. Um, in thinking about this, and, and I don't think about this in, in its, its own little box, I, I think about this across the region. Um, we have a big challenge in Region 1. It's a challenge that we've been carrying on for years, and I call it the, the challenge of restoring green capital. And, you know, one thinks the Berkshires is perhaps different than other parts of the region, but it's not so different in a, an important way. We all know that with industrialization in this region, we lost a lot. We lost our rivers to a large degree, not just this river, we lost a lot of rivers. The quality was, was greatly degraded. We also lost a lot of land. A lot of land was contaminated. Um, programs were built to address that. But fundamentally, what we're about in New England is restoring this green capital upon which we can build the prosperity that's going to carry through the 21st century and, and the generations beyond. And I always like to put this kind of work in that context because a lot of people like to project this conversation as it's economic versus environment. It's not that at all in my mind because the economy in fact is built on the environment in New England. We won't have prosperity in New England if our land is contaminated and our water is unhealthy. And we know that up front. Um, the, other, the other point, again, bring, I bring to this, you know, I've only worked for EPA for a year and a half. Um, I did work for EPA many years ago, but I was a short stint also. What you learn as a newbie at EPA is just the enormous talent that goes into the idea of cleaning up sites, cleaning up contaminated land. Um, if you think about it, there probably isn't an organization in the world that has, knows more about cleaning up land than EPA. We do it all over the country. We have talent like the talent you've met here all over the country. There's a cadre of super fun practitioners and remedial um, professionals who have done sites and other sites and, and others. We have people here in the back who you may have met who have over 30 years of experience dealing with sites and, and what you can do and, and the kinds of opportunities there are to clean it up. And their work is always measured against the work in other regions. In the end, what we will produce here we hope, we expect, there's no hope about it, we expect is, is to produce what we call a one EPA remediation plan. 
By that I mean anything that we do here will need to be measured against work elsewhere around the country. There will be peer review. Bob, Bob will talk about that later. But I want you to know that this, this, you're not alone in this. Not alone at all. The talent, the best talent from EPA is being brought to this, to this problem. Talent that you've met, I think, but, but talent that, that's around the country. Um, the, the third thing that my boss says very clearly is we have to be a listening organization. I've said this to the region, and we're doing a lot of work to, to help us with listening skills. Most people know that high-performing organizations are real good listeners. They can hear, they can understand, they, they pause, they listen, they try to get in the minds of the people who are speaking to them. What are they really saying to us? Let's, deep, let's, let's peel back that onion and really understand what they're talking about. And indeed, that's what we're trying to do here. And I guess when we get to the charrette a month from now, you'll, we'll be listening even more. These are about laying, this, this process about laying the uh, groundwork for that, for that listening process. But listening is something we value very much in the leadership of EPA. And of course, um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't repeat what is repeated to me over and over and over. We make decisions based on sound science and the law. And I, I, don't, I guess I wouldn't be out of school to say what you're hearing in Washington right now is a conversation, perhaps at a very high level, that that message isn't really taking hold. Nobody at EPA is pursuing things because we like to do it or we're arbitrary about it. We do it because there's a need to do it and there's science that supports what we do and there's a law that, that gives us the authority to do what we do. Um, and I want you all to remember that as we go forward. Um, nobody, I wish we were all home being able to play softball on this nice, nice night or, or out to dinner with our friends and family. We're all here because something pretty tragic happened in the Berkshire, uh, happened to the Berkshires in the Housatonic River uh, a couple decades ago. I mean, if it happened today in real time, it would be a horrible thing and the headlines would be terrible and, you know, what you saw around the, the Gulf spill would probably happen. But this happened a long time ago over a longer period of time, so the di dynamics are different. But that said, we're here because uh, we have a responsible party that needs to do something about the cleanup of this river. And we all know that, we need to keep that in mind. EPA is not bringing you here. The need to be here is to, to create a vision and a future for a healthy river that we can all use and enjoy going forward. So those are the, the things I want to bring to people. Um, I'm going to go through these slides really quickly. Um, I will be back for the charrette. Um, today, I spent time meeting with people. We'll go do some more meetings with them. Um, there's a process I'm going to have to manage, and that's getting the process from a remedy through a larger conversation all the way around to the end of the year. Hopefully, we'll have something that is uh, something we can all work from. But right now, there is no remedy until we go through that, through that whole process. Um, looking at what we're doing today, I, I don't need to talk a lot about these things. You can read as much as I can uh, recite. But the, the bottom line is we have steps we're going through. Um, corrective measure study, this is a RICRA project, not a Superfund project. You all know this by now. Um, our workshops, again, this is as good as anything anyone's tried to do anywhere in the country. Um, we, we're going to write about this when we're done. I, I can guarantee you the national program is, is going to hear about how successful this is, but that success depends on you, ultimately. Um, we're going through our workshop phases tonight. We're, we're exploring alternatives, as you know. Um, perhaps tonight will be as interesting as any of it, but I've heard from people I met today that the conversations about the river were really enlightening, and I'm, I'm glad you've, you've enjoyed them. Um, here are decision criteria. Let, I want you to know right up front, I couldn't go into specifics about this right now if I wanted to. I'm the political head of the agency. You have talent here that, that's going to work with these standards and bring them to me and explain how they all go together. And then there's going to be some key decisions. But know that the, these are the criteria we, we work with. Any remedial action or any corrective action around the country has to deal with the same thing. This isn't made up just for here. This is a, a, national, a national standard that we're, we have to address. Um, tonight's agenda, we're, we're going to go through um, the, the, the different, different alternatives and, and how we're thinking about this, but I don't want anybody to go away from here going, oh, we know what they're going to do, because that would be um, wrong to, to conclude that. Um, 
Tonight, we hope you get your heads around the same kinds of things that we're trying to get our heads around in trying to create a, a future for the Housatonic that we all can be proud of and, and that our kids can be proud of and their kids can be proud of. Um, as I think about this, and I think about this a lot, believe me, on, on, on matters of such gravity as this, I think about this um, a few minutes every day and, and we're, when we come to these kinds of events, I'm thinking about this all the time. I, I you know, what's, what I keep thinking about is that this is our opportunity. That we're not gonna get two bites at this apple. We're gonna get one. Um, and we have to do it well. And I think the folks at GE would say the same thing. That this has to be done, we have to do our very best here to come up with something that, that creates that future for the river we all want. And um, so I, I, I wanna emphasize and close with this point. We do this with utmost seriousness, utmost commitment, and, and really hard work will be put towards this. And I can tell you the team you're beating here is the best there is in the country for, for, for taking this on. And I'm very proud to lead them, and I hope you all feel the same thing as, you, as you've gotten to know them through this workshop process. As we go forward, it's always appropriate. We, you know, Jim Murphy's here. Um, questions are welcome, uh, open dialogue is welcome. Um, we need that input uh, moving forward. And so I, I'm so glad you're here to learn more about this and participate uh, in the process. So it is now my, who am I turning over to you, Steve? All right. So again, thank you all. And uh, I will be back. And I'm, again, watching this as, as closely as I can. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Steve Shapiro. I'm with the firm CERTA Strategies, and we've been uh, tasked by the EPA to help produce these series of mini workshops. We started with interviews in the community in the fall and early winter, and it was a result of the conversations we had with the community wanting more information, focused information, that led us to the suggestion to the EPA that they agreed from their findings as well that this is something that would really make a difference in the community to provide this level and background of information leading to the charrette that you've heard so much about. Uh, how many people were here Tuesday and Wednesday evening, just by a show of hands? Really, really wonderful. Really, thank, thank you all for being back here tonight. For those who weren't here, uh, this is not a traditional type public meeting in the sense that there's an open mic. Uh, we're finding that there's a nice flow of information by, uh, there's a yellow sheet, my hands are tied up, but there's a yellow question sheet in your workbook. And I'll go over that process in a moment. The workbook contains a two page statement which will call correlate to each of the PowerPoints that you're, the presenters will be making. There's, we'll have two presenters to start. We'll take a short break, come back for two more presenters, and then a full panel. There'll be an opportunity for questions, a few, few questions after each presenter goes. The, uh, you've heard about the HousatonicWorkshops.org. This was another response to the community wanting someplace simple where they can go, where all the information that's been uh, collected around this, the Rest of the River project is up there. Uh, the video from Tuesday night was posted today. The video for Wednesday night should be posted tomorrow. These are big files and it just takes a little bit of uh, uh, time to get those up, but we're working as fast as we can on that, as well as working as fast as we can on getting all the questions transcribed, those that were responded to and those that we didn't get a chance to answer. So for your questions this evening, we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. What we don't, don't please don't take it personally, but they will be answered and they will be up on the website. There's a blue form in your packet, which is for evaluations, just to let us know how the three days went, how you, what your, your thoughts were on the workshops, any comments you might have for the up and coming charrette, anything else you wanna let us know. Uh, there's also a registration opportunity. You'll hear a little bit more in detail about the charrette at the end of the evening. Let me, let me just go over the question process again. The yellow sheet contains two halves, a perforated 
uh, middle. Please address your questions in writing. Please write legible. Print, if you can. I think we all started with print first, before script. Um, it makes it a lot easier for me to read when we go over the questions, and I won't, I won't uh, edit your questions. Your questions are what they are. They're important to us. If it's a comment, we may not state the comment. We really want to focus the presenters on, on what's important to you all this evening. So with, with that, I'm proud to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Mike Palermo, who is a consult, consulting engineer with extensive international experience in dredged material management and contaminated sediment remediation. For the majority of his career, Dr. Palermo served with the U.S. Corps of Engineers as a research civil engineer and director of the Center for Contaminated Sediments at the Engineer Research and Development Center at the Waterways Experiment Station, where he managed and conducted both research and applied studies for the United States Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, the Department of Justice, NOAA, U.S. Navy, and others. Dr. Palermo received his B.S. and his Master's from Mississippi State and his Ph.D. in Environmental and Water Resource Engineering from Vanderbilt University. And I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Palermo. Well, I'm very happy to be here and uh, very happy to see that we have such a, a good turnout. Uh, a lot of interest in the community, and that's why we're here, just to, is to present some information to you and some generate, uh, generate some questions. I hope we get some good questions tonight. Um, I'll be talking about remediation technologies and techniques. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, ways to address uh, problems like we have here on the Housatonic. Uh, I'll be talking about these things uh, in a general way. I'm not going to be focusing on <clears throat> the specifics of this site uh, so much. That comes with speakers that come after me tonight. Uh, but I will be talking about uh, how these remediation technologies can be applied, some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we've been doing remediation of sediment uh, projects here in the United States for something on the order of 20 years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, during that time period, we have learned a lot. Uh, we've gotten, uh, you know, much uh, good information about how well they work, how easy they are to implement, uh, and that's what we build on as we, as we address new sites. Uh, just about every way that you could address the problem of remediating contaminated sediments would fall somewhere in this list of, of categories of, of alternatives. Uh, they go all the way from very simple approaches that don't involve a lot of uh, active work all the way down to things like dredging and capping. And what I'll be doing tonight is, is going over advantages, disadvantages, and a little bit of detail on how these technologies uh, can be uh, looked at, evaluated, and, and actually implemented. So the first one on that list is something called monitored natural recovery. Uh, you'll hear the, hear the initials MNR. A lot of times uh, if you read uh, papers and, and, doc and documents and reports about uh, sediments, uh, this alternative, I will, will say a couple of things about it first. It's not no action. Monitored natural recovery is not the no action alternative. It is a remediation uh, option because it does involve looking very closely at how natural processes tend to begin to reduce the risk over time. Also, another thing to keep in mind about MNR is that it usually is a part uh, of every remedy at almost every site because as we go to areas with lower levels of contamination, MNR is the most appropriate thing to look at uh, as an option for those you know, wider areas with lower levels of contamination in the sediments. So it's a part of every remedy, and it's, but it's not no action. And you can see the advantages of it are, are, are listed here. Uh, the main advantage is it's, it's limited to monitoring and looking at what's happening. Also, uh, imp implementation of something called institutional controls is usually a part of MNR. Things like fish advisories, which you have on this river here. Uh, it's a low cost option because it doesn't involve any active remediation, any active work uh, in the sediments like dredging or capping. Disadvantages are, are pretty easy to list too. 
the main one is that the sediments remain in the aquatic environment. They're, they're there. Uh, the risk is there. It takes time for MNR to, to reduce that risk. Uh, also, uh, MNR only works on the surface of the sediments. And so if you have a situation where you have contamination with depth and there's potential, say, for a storm or a flood to turn over and, you know, re, you know move around that sediment, MNR is not really a, a very effective way to, to look at, rem at, at the remedy. Uh, the main thing is that it's monitoring. That's why it's called monitored natural recovery. Now talking about the next one, in situ capping. In situ capping is an alternative that involves the placement of a isolating layer over a deposit of contaminated sediment to uh, physically and chemically isolate that sediment from the aquatic environment. Uh, it's a quick and easy remedy to uh, implement because it involves putting clean material down and when you do that over a given area you immediately see the benefit of the isolation with capping. Uh, so it's easy to implement, uh, cost is, is, is reasonable and favorable compared to some alternatives like dredging and disposal for most sites, not all sites, but for most sites. And one thing good about uh, capping uh, is this, and we've seen this in projects uh, in recent years, the idea of putting down a clean isolating cap gives us an opportunity to actually enhance the aquatic environment. If you have a degraded environment at some sites, uh, by placing that cap you can select materials that actually provide a better aquatic habitat than what might be there now, even from just a habitat standpoint, in addition to the benefits that you would get by the uh, isolation of the contamination. Uh, disadvantages, though, are, are some similar to the MNR. The sediments do remain in the aquatic environment even though they are isolated. Uh, and controlled. So that is a, definitely a disadvantage. And there are some physical ones. Uh, for instance, this one here, water depths may be reduced. Uh, the caps take up space. There are a thickness of material. And uh, by placing that thickness in a water body, especially a shallow water body, you could actually uh, change the nature of the habitat at that particular part of the water body, or even reduce the flow carrying capacity of a stream. So uh, you, have, you have that uh, a disadvantage with capping uh, if, it's, if it's implemented uh, alone. Uh, once again, the floods, the physical stability issue is important because caps could be eroded in a high energy event like a flood uh, or a storm uh, with wave action, and so the caps may require a layer that would resist that erosion. So that's something that has to be evaluated. Uh, you've seen the word monitoring before in MNR. Well, capping, because we have left the contamination in the water body, even though that cap is in place, usually it would require us to do uh, monitoring to make sure that the cap continues to provide the function it was designed to, to provide. In other words, just to make sure it remains effective in the long term, we would be doing monitoring. And there would be institutional controls required. For instance, if you place a cap in a water body, you may have restrictions on the size of a boat that could, could go through that area, or maybe restrictions on uh, anchoring uh, large vessels in that area. Looking a little bit more in detail with capping, uh, what is a cap supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to do really three things. Uh, first of all, is it physically isolates that sediment. It prevents benthic organisms from coming in direct contact with the sediment. And you've heard from earlier talks that the bioaccumulation of things like PCBs and organisms can go up the uh, aquatic food chain and even to us. And so uh, by providing physical isolation, we have essentially cut off that direct contact and that helps us control that pathway. Uh, physically, the cap also can stabilize the sediments because it can be designed to make uh, the sediment stable from things like flood events or, or wave action. By putting an armored cap over, we can actually stabilize a, a situation in the water body where contaminated sediments can be eroded and spread, uh, say, further downstream during a, during a flow event. And the last one is chemical isolation and actually the reduction of the potential for the movement or the flux of contaminants into the aquatic environment. The cap has to be designed uh, to provide that function as a chemical isolation cap, in other words, a cap that 
slows down that process and controls that process so that uh, our remediation goals would be met in the long term. Now to do these three things, a cap has to be engineered. Being an engineer, I can appreciate that word a lot. In other words, the engineering of that cap is critical to, to make sure that under a given set of site conditions that the cap would be effective. It's more than just putting down a layer of sand. Uh, th these caps have to be designed, and I'll show you some examples, with different components to match up with the uh, functions that we're trying to provide with the cap. So design is critical. Um, what do we look at uh, in determining the feasibility of capping? Well, this list is fairly simple, but it talks, it, it actually lists out some important processes. We have to have that cap compatible with what the waterway is going to be used for. If it's a large deep draft uh, navigation channel, is, is a very different situation than a very shallow river where we might only have, say, recreational boating taking place. So what the waterway is used for is critical. Uh, flow modification, I mentioned that the, the fact that caps take up space means that they would change the cross-section of, of a river reach, for instance, and might uh, actually change the ability of that river to carry flows, and so that has to be considered uh, in designing the cap. Depth limitation, same thing applies. I mentioned about the, the fact that shallowing up the water could change habitat. This particular one, groundwater flow, is important for caps uh, from the standpoint of chemical isolation. If you have groundwater flowing up through the bottom of the river, it's, it's a, a, a situation where the water is wanting to move through uh, the sediments, the cap has to be designed to offset that process. Uh, and, once, and, the, and lastly here, the erosion potential has to do with the physical stability of the cap. It has to be designed to resist episodic events such as a flood. And the last little statement here, if you look at all these processes, it is usually easier to evaluate those factors and find out what parts of an area, a project area, where capping might not be suitable. Uh, in other words, process of elimination. You find out the areas where, you, where capping won't work, and then you proceed to design the cap accordingly in areas where it will work. Here's a little cartoon, not a cartoon, I guess, but a sketch, if you want to call it that, uh, that shows you the um, a variety of cap designs that have been uh, considered, designed, and implemented at several sites. And uh, two things need to come out of this, two, two messages I'd like to convey out of this. First of all, all caps are not alike. Uh, because of the fact that we need to design the cap to, 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 to function in a specific site condition, uh, to remediate sediments with specific properties, uh, and to, to match the goals of a given project, caps will look different for different sites. You can see here that these examples, some of them show a, a rock armor layer to resist erosion, some of them don't. Uh, this particular example over here shows a habitat layer that has been specifically designed to provide aquatic, you know, good aquatic habitat at the surface of the cap with other layers like armor and, and chemical isolation layers below it. Uh, and these, these processes here all relate to components of a cap. And you can look at it from the standpoint that most caps are designed using an approach that I call the layer cake approach. In other words, you look at the, the things that are happening at that site, different layers of the cap may be uh, included in the design to meet the re requirements that those uh, different processes are, are, are requiring of the cap. So think in terms of a layer cake. Where have we done capping? Well, this is not a complete list by, by any means. Uh, we've done capping all over this country, different areas, different regions, different water body types. Also, you can see from the list that capping has been done in countries outside the United States. Uh, we've done capping on the Housatonic River in some of the uh, operable units that have already been uh, worked on. Uh, Fox River is a project I'm involved in where large areas, hundreds of acres uh, of a river system in Wisconsin are being uh, capped, and that's a PCB site. Uh, 
You can see others listed here, that you, some of which you may be familiar with. Silver Lake is one close to home here where a cap is going to be the primary uh, component of the remedy. So uh, the, the message I have here is, and it goes back to the fact that we've been doing work like this for 20-some-odd you know, years, we have capped a lot of sites. We have learned from what we've done so far, and all that experience comes to play now in the recent projects that we are involved in in, in designing and constructing these caps. Like anything else, once you complete uh, capping, say, as a component of a remedy, uh, you can't just say we're done. Uh, there's always monitoring, and along with that monitoring comes the need to potentially manage the site if you see uh, issues uh, come up. And the best example of this I can show is that, uh, for instance, in an area you might have a storm, you might see some erosion uh, at the edges of a cap, for instance, that you did not uh, anticipate because perhaps you didn't do the predictions of the forces uh, exactly as, 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 as strong as they would be. And you might have to look at uh, per perhaps collecting more information, doing more evaluations, or adding uh, armor to areas that you didn't have armor before. Uh, those are the examples of the kinds of things that we would do uh, depending on what uh, the, the monitoring program that we would uh, have in place would show us. So you're not done once you put, you put the cap down. You've got to keep monitoring, keep managing. Uh, the last category of remedy um, technology is, is actually you know, the dredging or the removal option where sediments are removed from the water body, we're going to pick them up, we got to do something with them. Uh, so it has, it has advantages and disadvantages like the others. Advantages are that, that we do remove the material from the aquatic environment. Sometimes they use the term mass removal. Uh, sometimes mass removal is not directly correlatable with risk reduction, but it does get the mass of sediment out of the water body, which would prevent essentially future potential for spreading of that under other events. Uh, dredging is a proven technology, and I'll talk a little bit about that in another slide to come. Uh, easily implemented. Uh, the dredging is easily implemented to me. Uh, dredging is a fairly straightforward process. Uh, but for environmental dredging, the thing gets more complicated than for the dredging you might be familiar with for navigation. But as a general rule, the dredging part of the remedy uh, is easy to implement. Uh, the disposal is not as easy. Disadvantages, every time we dredge, we resuspend sediment to some degree. All dredges resuspend some sediment. Uh, once that sediment is resuspended in the water column, there will be some potential for contaminant release to the water column, either attached to the particles that are resuspended or released as dissolved contaminants to the water column. All dredges leave some residual sediments. It's impossible, really, to go out to a site with a dredge, remove a layer of contaminated sediment, uh, and completely get every molecule of contaminated sediment, every particle. Can't do it. So there are residual sediments to deal with. Uh, luckily, there are ways to manage these processes that we can consider for sites, but those are disadvantages of the, of the dredging process. Disposal, to me, is the, is the real uh, difficulty with a removal option. In other words, disposal of that contaminated sediment is expensive. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of complication if you're designing a site specific to that project. It might involve lots of transportation uh, to something like a landfill, perhaps. And we'll be mentioning some of these options in some slides to follow. But those are the disadvantages with removal. I mentioned that dredging is a proven technology. Uh, navigation dredging you're familiar with, uh, probably have seen uh, examples of that before. Uh, a lot of the things we do for navigation dredging, we also do for environmental dredging. But environmental dredging, uh, the purpose of, of removal of that sediment is different than for navigation. Our purpose is to remove certain sediments that we want to remove, whereas for navigation our purpose is to create water depth. So the, the purposes dictate some changes. And for navigation dredging, cost is an important factor, but for environmental dredging, costs are secondary to effectiveness. 
Here's some examples of equipment, uh, dredging equipment, that have been used for uh, environmental dredging. Uh, some of it you're probably familiar with. Uh, in dredging, we have basically two uh, major ways the sediment is removed, either hydraulically or mechanically. Uh, this is an example of a mechanical dredge, common uh, conventional clamshell used for, commonly used for navigation dredging. Uh, this is an example of a hydraulic dredge. This is a cutter head dredge uh, used to hydraulically remove sediments uh, for navigation. Uh, those same types of equipment can be used for environmental work. But there are other types. Uh, for instance, this is a bucket that you may have, if you're, if you've, if you're trying to follow these technologies, you've, you've probably heard the term environmental bucket. Well, it's a bucket essentially that works the same way as this one, but differently in the sense that it's designed to, tr to remove sediments, to minimize resuspension, and perhaps minimize the amount of residuals left behind. Uh, just a different design, uh, especially for environmental work. But other mechanical types like backhoes can be used. Other hydraulic types like swinging ladder cutter heads or horizontal auger cutter heads can be used. These are all dredges that have been used in many, many projects. In addition to those, you sometimes will hear the, the category or the term specialty dredge. There are specialty types of dredges that have been designed to do environmental work uh, some of them not here in the U.S., but uh, overseas. Uh, these are some examples of some of these dredges. Uh, this is a specialty dredge that's been used up in the Fox River, for instance, to do uh, very thin layer removals. Uh, we've even had projects where divers have removed uh, contaminated sediments or, you know, in small areas in very difficult to reach places. Uh, and this picture here shows dry excavation. Uh, dry excavation is not dredging. Uh, that's excavation uh, where a portion of the water body is dewatered, maybe isolated by sheet piles, water uh, removed, and then the excavation done in the dry. In fact, that was what was done uh, in OU, well, the what is it, half mile reach and, and mile and a half reach, both. They, they did dewatering and excavation in the dry. No pun intended, but environmental dredging bottom line is that uh, there's no magic dredge, first of all, important. No magic dredge that is the best dredge <clears throat> to do environmental work at every site. Uh, you can use conventional equipment, although special equipment is available. Remember, all dredges resuspend some sediment and leave some residuals. Usually we can predict that to some degree and we can control that to some degree. All decisions about what dredge to use are, should be risk-based and and very project and sediment specific. Now, how am I doing on time? Pretty good? Speed up. Okay, I'm always guilty of having to speed up. Good. Uh, so, you know, if we dredge, we gotta do something with that sediment. And so one of the most common ways to do this is containment. It's a proven technology. These uh, different types of sites like CDF shown here uh, are landfills, uh, are common. Uh, they, they have the ability to engineer controls to uh, prevent movement of contaminants. So they're fairly cost effective. Uh, disadvantage, there's a super fun preference for treatment. Siting these sites, if you're going to build a new one, is very difficult to do. And you have to monitor. So you have to monitor the disposal site as well. There's always a lot of interest in sediment treatment. Everybody thinks that there's a magic process that we can use to uh, sprinkle some, you know, proprietary stuff and make this problem go away. Uh, I've yet to see that. Uh, there are sediment treatment processes that are effective for different classes of contaminants, some for PCBs, uh, things like incineration, for instance. Uh, but the, the, the advantages of these types of approaches are they're, they're very popular, uh, and there's a super fun preference for treatment. Disadvantages are sediment treatment is very expensive. There are emissions and discharges. Uh, there may be requirements to do pretreatment before you do the sediment treatment, and you still got to get rid of the stuff. Even if you treat it, you still got to carry it off somewhere and dispose of it, because you can't destroy the, 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 the sediment mass itself. Here's a pie chart that shows you the, a most recent breakdown of technologies that have been selected to remediate contaminated sediment sites nationwide. This is put together by EPA. 
headquarters, and what you see is dredging or excavation. 55% of sites have, have selected that so, as the sole remedy approach. Another 31% have combined dredging or excavation with capping, so that accounts for most every site. Only 6% of sites or so, 6% or so, have used capping only as the remediation approach, and only 6% or so of sites have used MNR only as the, cap, as the sole remedy approach. So it shows you that for most every site, except a low percentage, at least some excavation is done. And the important message there is it's usually, you know, usually the most efficient remedy for most sites is a combined remedy where some dredging, some capping, some MNR are applied, especially at very com complex sites. So as far as implementing remedies, a couple of quick things. Contr you know, there's a rule in sediment remediation. Control the sources first. So that's at the top of the list. You can sequence remediation, usually upstream to downstream. And you can, you can use uh, portions of sites and, and, and remediate portions in sequence. Uh, you'll hear this term severally, several times tonight, adaptive management. Be flexible, be able to change some aspects of the way you go about it based on what you learn. And then this last thing, combined technologies usually offer the best solution. And the last slide I have is something I put together years ago, a list of 10 principles for effective sediment remedies. And they go all the way from everything looked at risk-based, control sources, as I mentioned, all the way down through, this is my favorite phrase, develop site-specific, project-specific, and sediment-specific remedies. Everything's got to be done specifically for the site. And lastly, monitor. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. A few questions from the community. Is there a suction? This was from Tuesday evening, actually, that was, was a holdover for you for tonight. Is there a suction system, not dredging, which would discern between PCBs and invertebrates, vertebrates, to return, to return them back to the environment? Um, without killing the critters? I think the question is not removing PCBs, but removing PCB contaminated sediments. Probably. Um, well, let me just say this, that dredging usually will, uh, you know, disrupt the aquatic environment where it's done. Usually most of the organisms would, would be um, impacted. Uh, I wouldn't say that all of them would be killed. It depends on the organism, depends on the type of dredge. Especially this is true for mechanical dredging. The problem is, though, if we're dredging, we're going to carry this off to an upland site, so those, those organisms are, are going to be impacted. They're going to go. Okay. What is the lifetime of an NC2 cap? Have any of the caps failed? If capping is done in the rest of the river, who will be responsible for monitoring EPA or GE at what cost? <laughs> Several questions there. Uh, well, first of all, the, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly answer the longevity question. Uh, caps can be designed to be effective in the long term. Uh, usually what we try to do at most sites, and we can do this usually at PCB sites, we design the cap so that the, the chemical isolation is effective and eventually gets to a steady state condition uh, where the, the objectives of the re remedy are met forever. If, as long as that cap stays in place, we can meet the criteria. Uh, and that's easier to do with a, a, a contaminant like PCBs. Uh, so long term. Uh, as far as monitoring, what was the second part of the question? Have any, have any failed? Oh, okay. Some caps have, have been placed in a way that they did not lay out the way they were supposed to. In other words, some caps have been placed too fast over soft sediments, and mud waves have occurred, and some of that sediment's turned over. So in that sense, some caps have not been constructed properly. Uh, there have been a couple of instances where capping in conditions uh, use, where non-aqueous phase liquids have been present, and some of these have, have 
gone up through a cap and the caps have had to be modified. Usually those were situations where the conditions weren't adequately assessed to begin with and the design was not adequate to handle that problem. And who, who's responsible for, for well, the Well, the monitoring, the, the monitoring, it would be the responsibility of, uh, of, of a response, and I'm not talking this site in particular, I'm talking about in general, uh, the responsible party would usually be responsible for paying for the monitoring uh, and and looking at that for some, usually for some set period of time. Okay. How would you design a cap in a pond or lake that contains natural springs feeding into the lake from below the cap? Well, what you're describing there is a situation where that groundwater flow that I mentioned uh, is it maybe can, it can be identified as a spring, perhaps. And of course, that's a, a more difficult condition to design a cap for. Uh, if you especially if you have you know a real spring, uh, but let me just say this: that usually that's, those are not the kind of sites where we have contaminated sediments. Mm. So, and aren't vacuum type dredging projects better than claw type projects? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There, uh, there's no general rule that says hydraulic dredging is always better than mechanical dredging. A lot depends on how you, what you're going to do with the sediment once you pick it up. It also depends on a lot of other factors like the thickness that you have to remove, the nature of the sediments, and so on. Okay. There's a number more questions for Mike. We'll try to get to at the panel. Um, but I'd like to keep the evening moving. And thank you, Dr. Palermo. Our next speaker is someone who you heard Tuesday evening. Uh, Tuesday evening he talked about geomorphology and the river, and tonight he's going to talk about restoration. Um, I'd like to introduce Keith Bowers. Keith Bowers is the president and founder of Biohabitats Inc., one of the premier firms specializing in environmental restoration, conservation planning, and regenerative design. He is internationally recognized He's an internationally recognized landscape architect who has planned, designed, and managed the construction of over 200 ecological restoration projects throughout the U.S. Keith Bowers. Great. Thank you, Steve. So this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, um, ecological restoration. I've been involved with it for almost 30 years now in my career and have been involved with the Society for Ecological Restoration, which is an international society that advocates and promotes restoration around the world. And um, I'm fortunate enough now to serve as their global restoration ambassador, so I get to travel all over the world to look at restoration projects and help form and shape policy on restoration from an international perspective. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about ecological restoration, what it is, and how it's being applied to river systems um, across the United States. So what is ecological restoration? What is the definition of it? Well. SCR, the Society for Ecological Restoration, has developed what they call the SIR primer. And that primer is all about restoration. It talks about the definition of restoration, what are the scientific attributes of restoration, how it should be used, how it's different from rehabilitation and reclamation. And it also lists, as I mentioned before, a definition. And that definition is that ecological restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. So I think the important ter terms in this definition are assisting and recovery. The really restoration is an active process that happens over time. And it really is a process. It's not a necessarily an end state. It's an ongoing process. And when we have to think about restoration, we have to think about it in terms of it being a process. It initiates and accelerates the recovery of an ecosystem along an intended trajectory that supports critical ecological processes. So again, that word accelerate, um, that it is accelerating the recovery of a system, and it's along an intended trajectory. So in other words, we're not just setting uh, conditions for whatever happens. We're actually setting conditions for an intended trajectory of what we want to see happen over a period of time, whether that time period is 10 years years out, 50 years out, 100 years out, or even longer. So 
Sometimes we think about restoration as going back in time and restoring a landscape that may have existed in a previous time period, whether that's a year ago, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, or even 1,000 years ago. And I like to think of restoration as really about restoring the future, not necessarily about restoring the past. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we start off with an ecosystem, a healthy, thriving, vibrant ecosystem, that ecosystem over time has a certain trajectory. If we believe in evolution, that's what's happening with this ecosystem. But sometimes we have disturbances that happen to our landscape, our ecosystems, and we end up with a damaged, degraded, or destroyed ecosystem. So when we think about restoration, we're not necessarily going back to an ecosystem in a previous time period. In fact, it's probably impossible to do that. We know that watersheds change, uh, weather patterns change, urbanization, land use, land cover changes. And so it's really impossible to recapture that landscape in a previous time period. So what we're really thinking about is what is the trajectory of that, uh, what is the restoration trajectory? What is the probable trajectory of that ecosystem without disturbance? And there, that's where we think about restoration is moving forward in time, where we're going back and looking at that original ecosystem because it has certain attributes that are important to us and that we can learn from, but we're also looking at that ecosystem as if it hadn't been disturbed through that time period and where would it be today? And those are the attributes we need to think about in terms of restoration. What we've also seen quite a bit is what we call these novel ecosystems, ecosystems that are beginning to develop around the world because of human intervention. We know that invasive species are traveling around the world, we have climate change, we have nit over nitrification, and our population is increasing. So we're now seeing assemblages of plants and animals that we've never seen before in history. And so we need to think about restoration not only in the future, but in order to have a resilient ecosystem, we need to be thinking about these novel ecosystems as well. So it is really about restoring the future. So what should good restoration embrace? Well, several things. One, like I said before, it's processes. And we talked about that on Tuesday, about river processes in particular. So first of all, we need to think of an ecosystem as is, is an ecosystem that, that's really shaped and formed and the functions of those eco ecosystems are, are predicated on the processes that are happening there. Whether it's hydrologic processes, whether it's nutrient cycling, whether it's energy energy flows, those processes are what give the landscape function and what give the landscape form. The other thing that we need to embrace is diversity, complexity, and resiliency. Those key items are really important to have a, a, a long thriving, healthy ecosystem. The more diverse it is, the more complex it is, the more resilient that ecosystem is going to be. So when we look at restoration, we need to take those and, and use those, those uh, characteristics in our restoration projects. We also need a clear trajectory towards success. What I mean by that is you all have a certain trajectory you would like to see in terms of restoration. We have a certain trajectory. Everybody's going to have a different trajectory. And we all need to be in unison and collaborate on what that trajectory is. Where do we want that ecosystem to be in a year from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, even 1,000 years from now? And if we can come up with a clear vision and goals and objectives of where that ecosystem is going to be in a certain point in time, then we can map out that trajectory over time as well. And lastly, but most important, we need to be adaptive. We don't know everything about ecosystems. We don't know everything about nature. We're all still learning about that. We need to be adaptive in the way that we design, plan, implement, monitor, and manage restoration projects. So it's extremely important that we, we build in that adaptive uh, capacity as well. So, also, good restoration relies on templates, and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, when we look at restoration, we do look at the historic, what we call the historic fidelity of a site. As I mentioned before, we go back and we look at what a healthy, vibrant ecosystem is. And we can do that by going back in time and looking at certain ecosystems, or we can find ecosystems out there now that are similar to the one that we want to restore and look at those characteristics. Um, Rich uh, gave an excellent presentation on Tuesday about the historic conditions of the Housatonic River. And we can learn from that in terms of 
restoration. We could look at the river processes that are going on out there now, and we can learn from them in terms of using that information to develop a good ecological restoration plan and implementation. We have to look at processes. We have to look at form and how that form shapes the landscape and gives structure to the landscape, what we call morphology. Those are important characteristics as well in terms of setting up a good template for restoration. Vegetation and composition and structure. What is the vegetation composed of? How is it structured? Extremely important from a habitat standpoint. So if we can find healthy, vibrant ecosystems that we can use as templates for doing restoration, that, that, will, that will be ideal. And then finally, human engagement and use. All humans use ecosystems. We're not a separate part of ecosystems. We're engaged in all ecosystems. And we need to make sure our restoration projects include human engagement, whether it's from a cultural or social standpoint or a recreational standpoint. So what is the recipe for success for ecological restoration? Well, let me define that by giving you some um, uh, clear uh, ingredients here. One is having a clear rationale. What is the rationale for doing restoration in the first place? Has that landscape been degraded? Has it been damaged? Has it been destroyed? And in this case, we're talking about if remediation is a viable alternative for the Housatonic River, then that probably gives us a clear rationale to include restoration is a component of that. What are, then we need to find out what those goals and what is the trajectory of for, for success. Defining specific goals, defining specific objectives, and mapping out that trajectory is important. Having a thorough ecological characterization of the sites, extremely important. And John on Tuesday talked about all the data that's been collected for many, many years on the site. Um, and many of the other presenters have talked about all that data too. So in the case of the Housatonic, we have a lot of good ecological characteristics characterization of the site. Sound science and engineering, that's what restoration is really about, applying good sound science and applying engineering um, to, to the challenge. Having uh, that designation and description of a reference system as we just talked about, and then integrating with the surrounding landscape. We can't think of restoration with four boundaries around it, and we're only going to restore the site in isolation with the rest of the landscape. So we need to consider the influences from, from the landscape onto our site, and in the case of river restoration, we need to specifically think about the influences from the watershed and how that influences the site as well. Explicit plans, schedules, budgets, all of those need to be drafted up for a program, as well as monitoring evaluation, and then, as um, Mike mentioned earlier, adaptive management. Adaptive management really is becoming the framework for couching all of these different ingredients into a restoration program. And what is adaptive management? Well, there is some, obviously, uncertainty about how ecological systems function and how they respond to different management actions. We don't know it all. We're still learning on some of this. And so what we need to do is when we do the design and when we implement the project, we need to go out and monitor it. We need to evaluate how well it's doing, whether it's on that trajectory for success, and what kinds of adjustments or modifications need to be made in order to correct any deficiencies um, in, in future phases of the plan. So it's really important to uh, include an adaptive management program in the site. Now, river restoration has come a long way over the last three or four hundred years, and in fact, river restoration, you know, in the early stages of settling this country was more about ditching and straightening channels for agriculture, for forestry, um, and then on for urbanization. And in fact, urbanization, we s still saw a lot of the same things happening out there with our streams and river systems, except in many cases, we are now looking at flood control, and in fact, that's what happened to that first mile and a half and half mile reach that was remediated um, along the Housatonic, that's a flood control channel and that's what we did a lot of and unfortunately we're still doing some of that in some cases. Um, in the 1960s many agencies started getting concerned about fish habitat, especially for fi sport fish habitat and so specific habitat techniques were beginning to be applied to streams but they were being applied in what I would call very non-holistic in a very targeted way. Um, 
and really the 1970s and 80s, the age of riprap. It's really an emphasis on bank stabilization with maybe some habitat improvement, but it was really about stabilizing eroding banks because we were still really talking about and learning about fluvial geomorphology and its effects on these banks in terms of, of river processes, erosion, sediment transport, and deposition. But really, since the 1980s, there's been a real surge in looking at rivers from a more holistic standpoint, in terms of looking at those processes that I talked about the other night, looking about the functions and how they're shaped and formed, and how those shapes and forms then circle back and influence the river. We've learned that integrating the river with the surrounding landscape is extremely important in restoration from a, from a river and riparian standpoint. We also have learned from a cultural and recreation standpoint that it's important to include those attributes in restoration projects. And we need to be taking into account future changes in terms of watersheds, in terms of land use, in terms of weather patterns, and a whole host of other uh, um, ecological and cultural changes to the landscape. And then finally, establishing a more resilient and self-sustaining river and floodplain system is what we're really after for the long run. Now, the Housatonic, as I mentioned before on Tuesday night, is somewhat of a recovering river. There was uh, changes in land cover and in land use throughout the valley, which then started having influences on the morphology of the channel and changing the hydrology and hydraulics of the channel. And we're still seeing evidence of the recovery of those changes and impacts um, uh, many, many years later. And in fact, if we can think of an ecosystem as this uh, green bar going across the middle of the, the chart here, we know that ecosystems have what I call this dynamic equilibrium. They fluctuate. They typically, though, fluctuate within a boundary. So while they're dynamic in how they operate, they're in equilibrium with the rest of the landscape and other ecosystems. And really what we're, we look at in terms of ecological restoration, if there's the disturbance that happens to one of these ecosystems, if we allow passive ecosystem recovery, allow that ecosystem to recover on its own. There are some ecosystems that are fairly resilient, others that are less resilient, and depending on the impact and the disturbance may take a long time to recover on their own. However, if we look at employing an ecological restoration and initiate that ecological restoration, we can drastically reduce the recovery time of some of these disturbances. And we, have, we, we can also look at really fine-tuning to uh, 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 restore that ecosystem to a dynamic equilibrium. Now, the Housatonic, the upper one and a half and a half mile reach, had remediation done to it and restoration as well. And you can see the shot here on the left-hand side, during remediation, and then um, a couple years after the remediation took place. And there was a fairly good coverage of riparian uh, vegetation along here, um, and the system recovered fairly well. Downstream near the confluence, um, a lot of rock was used along there. Again, a flood control channel, so st stability along this part of the channel was, was very, very important. But We've learned a lot, even from that project, in terms of looking at how we can employ habitat features and bank stabilization features um, integrated in with remediation projects to not only improve the site from an aesthetic standpoint, but improve those ecological processes and those ecological functions. And in fact, we're doing this, um, our practitioners, ecological restoration practitioners are doing this all over the country now, if not all over the world, where they're taking river systems, as you can see up here in the top two photographs, and they're using the science of fluvial geomorphology. They're using hydrolic Hydro, hydrologic and hydraulic engineering. They're looking at sediment transport and they're looking at stream uh, uh, aquatic ecology and riparian ecology. And they're employing all those techniques in such a way where they're bringing back and restoring these streams in that dynamic equilibrium. And so the more we can work with the morphology of the channel, actually the less major stabilization that we need to do along the beds and banks. Um, this is being employed, uh, as I mentioned, in, in different areas from extreme stream bank 
uh, erosion, as you can see over there on the left-hand side, where we have 15 high-foot banks. And again, working with the morphology of the river, of cutting down those banks, uh, uh, employing the right meander geometry in there, looking at those pools and riffles and where they should be placed, looking at how sediment is transported through the system, and then looking at how the riparian system can be revegetated with native plants and native species in a way that we get an accelerated recovery rate on many of these systems here. And in fact, what's really important, as I mentioned Tuesday night too, is um, how is that river connected to its floodplain? And are floodwaters able to get out of the channel and up into the floodplain to help dissipate some of that energy and also hydrate the floodplain and provide additional habitat and ecological characteristics for the flora and fauna that live there? So restoration has to be resilient from many factors. Um, this is, uh, th uh, again, there's different techniques that can be used, um, whether there are uh, boulders placed in strategic ways with woody debris. Um, what, you can't, what you can barely make out in the right-hand top photographs are what we call root wads or tree stumps um, integrated in with boulders and integrated in with what we call soil bioengineering, live plants in that stream bank there to stabilize that bank, but it provides great habitat from a riparian standpoint and fantastic aquatic habitat as well, where we can introduce a deep pool for fish habitat. And you can see the same kind of concepts on the lower of two photographs as well. And looking at other situations, um, whether it's out in the field using, again, uh, soil bioengineering techniques or even rock and boulder placed in strategic ways that provide that aquatic habitat, but also stabilize these stream banks. And in the case of the lower right-hand side, you can see the riff riffle structure in there that provides great fish uh, habitat for feeding, and then the pool around the outside bend. So it's learning where those features exist in rivers and how to employ them. And in fact, we can even look at channels that have been stabilized, and in this case, lined with concrete in the past. And this is a series of five photographs over a period of about four or five years of taking out this concrete here, reinstalling a natural bed system in here in terms of gravel size, riffles, and pools, and then revegetating re the floodplain over time until right now we get a situation like this where we have a completely revegetated floodplain. But the really important concept about this project and many of these river restoration projects is they're still subjected to the hydraulic the flows from the watershed and the hydraulics um, in the channel itself. And they're able to carry those flows in such a way because they're able to access the floodplain and storm events, but they can still provide great aquatic habitat in here. So we've learned how to combine those different sciences and engineering to do that. So we go from a situation um, of a concrete line ditch to something like this that um, really brings life back to the whole system. So when we look at restoration, we need to think about it in terms of phases. Um, it's a process that happens over a time period. We need to think about working with rivers, um, how we can employ certain techniques to improve aquatic habitat, improve riparian habitat, stabilize stream banks, stabilize stream beds. And then from a, a wetland standpoint, um, oxbow standpoint, vernal pools, uh, riparian uh, wetlands, we've learned a lot there over the past 30 or 40 years in terms of working with floodplain hydrology, flooding from the river, from groundwater interfacing with the uh, surface of the water, looking at ways of introducing aquatic and amphibian habitat into these systems and integrating them in with the stream and floodplain as well. There's been a lot of re river restoration success stories. Loring Air, Air Force Base up in Maine, it was a contaminated soil and sediment remediation project. Um, with that project came a restored stream, wetland and floodplain habitats, restored native plant communities, and restored in-stream habitats to support trout species. Yes, trout fisheries. Out in Salt Lake um, City in Utah, the Provo River, a huge restoration project over 20 miles long in terms of restoring the river form and ecological function of this river. It was restored to a multiple thread channel with a complex floodplain features, oxbows, side channels, and floodplain wetlands. So it was pretty comprehensive and holistic. There were levee setbacks to still control flooding, but it was reconnected to the floodplain. And that project's been a great success. 
success. Um, right now, uh, the Upper Clark Fork uh, River is going through a restoration project just above Missoula, uh, Montana. That was a consent degree with the uh, state of Montana and ARCO. It's a super fun cleanup of removing toxic metals um, from the stream beds, stream banks, and the floodplain along 43 river miles. And the approach that this, this community is taking and this river is taking is through community outreach, coming up with a really strong restoration vision and employing or engaging scientific learning throughout the whole process. So in an effect, using adaptive management in a way where, where they can learn as they're actually designing and implementing this restoration project. The goal for that project is to provide a vibrant model for integrated restoration that provides long-term ecological, economic, and cultural assets for the water. So they're not just looking at this from an ecological standpoint, they're also looking at it from a uh, economic and cultural asset standpoint as well. Nine mile run in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, an urban river that went under restoration um, about five, six, seven years ago. Large urban channel with adjacent contaminated soils. Channel stabilization was key to this river in terms of it not meandering into the contaminated soils, in stream aquatic habitat enhancement, and really floodplain kind of or floodplain connectivity, reconnection to the floodplain, and wetland creation along adjacent areas of the riparian floodplain were extremely important in this project. What, what's interesting here is there was some fish monitoring done on that project before and after. It's, in fact, there's still monitoring going on. But in the year 2000, on the top left-hand side, there were um, essentially five species of fish that were um, monitored in the stream um, in 2000, and the lower uh, graph shows the number of fish that were actually uh, uh, sampled, 89. So in 2000, there were five different species, 89 fish all, all told. After the project was done in 2006, that jumped to seven species of fish, and one year later, nine species of fish. So two years after the restoration was completed, almost twice as many species of fish inhabited that river. And what's really startling is, is that we went from 89 fish to one year after the restoration to 116 fish, and then two years later to 759 fish in that river. And so we see a drastic increase in terms of what that restoration can do. North Gray's River Restoration in Maryland. Here it's really restoring a complex of riparian wetlands, bogs, and vernal pools. And you can see from the top photograph all the way to the bottom, that was a restored bog and uh, complex wetland system through there. Um, so I these kinds of systems can be successfully done, um, and they're being done all across the country. So I'll ask you all, and you can think about this, and hopefully think about it if you're going to come to the charrette, which I hope all of you will in two or three weeks, what would a restored restor Housatonic River look like to you? Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, a few questions and then we're going to have to get to a break. Uh, Mr. Bowers, can you talk more about collaboration, especially the input of environmental, the environmental community and other river users? Sure, well I think that collaboration and engagement with the community is important in developing any type of restoration plan. And so I think the adaptive management framework could provide uh, a great framework or mechanism for um, uh, providing that kind of community input from different organizations. Okay. How are very rocky riverbeds restored? Ah. Very rocky riverbeds, um, in fact, most of the time you find really rocky riverbeds in steeper sections or steeper rivers. And those kinds of systems, whether we call them step pool systems or from a geologic standpoint, have a lot of boulders and rocks. There are they're being restored all across the country too, and you ju we just need to look at the dynamics of those systems. Typically, they have a steeper gradient. Typically, the floodplain's a bit narrower. You have higher velocities of flow, but you have pool areas, and you have either falls or riffle areas. And there are ways to, again, use reference reaches and other templates and the knowledge, uh, the scientific knowledge of fluvial geomorphology and hydraulic and hydrology engineering and sediment transport to also design those systems. When you say you have much data for the Housatonic, do you in fact mean the river from source to end 
in ocean or just of sites around GE contamination? So I'm talking about the studies that, that both GE and EPA have performed over the last 10 to 15 years, that data. Okay. Regarding ecological restoration, I did not see animals listed. Plants were, but not animals. How does animal restoration, not just fish, occur in river restoration? It's a great question. Um, animal restoration is an extremely important component of any restoration project. Um, there are two ways that they're incorporated or reintroduced to these types of projects. One is, do you have adjacent populations um, and are those populations vibrant enough and can migrate to the area that you're restoring and establish new populations within the area that you're restoring? Or does the restoration process in and of itself um, do you need to go in and salvage or remove certain species and then return those species to the system after you've restored the, the um, uh, physical aspects of the site? So both of those kinds of uh, uh, mechanisms could be used in terms of uh, wildlife uh, reintroductions or fauna restoration. Okay. When planning and designing botanical restoration for riparian and floodplain ecosystems, do you account for long-term monitoring uh, this is a multi-part question, so... Okay. You, well, yes, absolutely, you, you account for long-term monitoring because you're looking at how that, that plant community evolves over time, what kind of disturbances take place, what kind of mortality takes place, and um, whether, it's wor whether it's meeting that trajectory you've set out in the beginning. Okay. These ecosystems are complex. It has taken s centuries to be created. Is it the height of human hubris to expect one for one replacement? No, um, we can't expect we, we can't expect one to one replacement. Um, again, restoration is looking at accelerating that recovery process. So what we what we see out there now in terms of the Housatonic and the floodplain, that whole area was deforested, or a good portion of it was deforested at one time, and we've seen natural recovery take place. We, we've learned a lot about what happens during natural recovery, and we can take that template and those mechanisms and accelerate that process. Okay. Well, one last question for, for now, and we'll have more for the okay. panel. Could you talk about the use of veins and weirs to change the energy of the river flow to protected banks instead of using riprap? Sure. There are in, what we call in-stream um, techniques that can be used in the channel itself that actually take the energy that's being from the water that's being forced up against the banks and rechannel that energy toward the center of the river. Um, a couple of those techniques that you just mentioned, veins, rock veins or log veins, are actually um, veins that come out from the channel bank and as you can imagine any any ledge in a channel, if you look at a channel, water flows perpendicular over that. So if you have a vein that's actually slanted back upstream and water's heading for the bank, but then overflows that, that vein, it's actually redirecting that flow and that energy back to the center of the channel. And by doing something like that in channel, then you don't necessarily need the massive stabilization along the banks because you're redirecting that energy before it hits the bank. Thank you, Keith. Okay, thank you. We uh, have a uh, opportunity here from two EPA officials who have been working on the Resto River project for a long time, and to um, try to to explain to the community their view and perspective on where things stand at this point in time. I first um, like to introduce Bob Chincherillo. Bob is the chief Massachusetts Superfund section. He's the chief of the Massachusetts Superfund section, Office of Site Remediation Restoration, EPA New England. Bob received his chemical, his degree in chemical engineering from the University of Lowell and is in charge of these, the uh, Superfund section for the New England Regional Office. Bob Chancherulo. Uh, as Steve said, I'm Bob Chancherulo. I'm chief of uh, the section that basically oversees the federal cleanup projects in the state of Massachusetts, and that includes the GE Satonic project. Um, I'm going to try to 
put together a lot of what you've heard over the last two and a half days and uh, how those sort of fit into the alternatives and technologies uh, in the decision making process that uh, that we're embarking on here for the for the rest of river project uh, so this is a diagram that some of you maybe have seen in the past that basically goes through uh, a lot of what you what you uh, heard about over the last couple of days you know the, the uh, investigation that we've conducted on the uh, on the river, uh, the, the various risk assessments, ecological and human health risk assessments. You heard yesterday about uh, the, the effort uh, modeling the behavior of the river and the contamination. Uh, those, all of those studies basically fed into uh, one of the worst acronyms we have probably, IMPGs, Interim, interim Media Protection Goals. Uh, basically a set of cleanup goals that, basic, that would address uh, any unacceptable risks that we found to human health or the environment uh, as sort of a benchmark of you know what, what we should be shooting for in any type of cleanup activity uh, all of those fed into the process that we're, we're uh, that we've been underway with now is the corrective measures study the CMS uh, you may hear me refer to it as a feasibility study at other sites we might call that a feasibility study evaluation of various cleanup options to deal with uh, any uh, you know, basically to deal with the uh, risks at the site uh, that document will feed into really the next major process uh, that, that we're leading up to here, which is when EPA comes out uh, and proposes a cleanup plan for, for public comment. Uh, so we haven't made any determination on what we think the appropriate course of action is. You've seen GE's studies, GE's uh, reports on that. Uh, and we really want to hear from you through this, this process and through the upcoming charrette process on sort of, you know, uh, how you feel about uh, where things ought to head. Um, and then that proposal would lead then to a final cleanup decision after a public comment period. I'll get into all of that in a little while. Uh, so the corrective measure study, the last, uh, went through a couple major iterations. The last uh, major revision was in October 2010, and that was basically put out for uh, for public comment at that time. We got a large number of comments on it. There's a wide range of alternatives, um, and I'm gonna run through some of this as, as best we can. Uh, 10 alternatives for sediment cleanup, nine alternatives for floodplain cleanup, and there are five alternatives that deal with uh, treatment or disposal of any material that, that might be excavated as part of any cleanup. Um, we thought about how we were going to portray this, this giant table. We probably would have needed the whole wall to display it so you can see it. So it's on page nine of your, of your uh, workshop booklet. Uh, I'm going to refer to uh, some of this, and it's really sort of a take-home message. But this is really the array of the, the, uh, the 10 sediment cleanup options. Uh, and the, across the top, in, if you look in your book, it's basically broken down by river reach, and you've heard that over the last few days, uh, breaking the study area up into smaller areas, and, and the potential cleanup options could vary uh, from reach to reach and even within those reaches. Uh, and then here we have 10 sediment cleanup options down the, down the left-hand side. Uh, similarly, uh, for floodplain alternatives, uh, and I'm going to get into these in more detail, there were nine uh, floodplain alternatives, uh, and those aren't necessarily um, reach specific, although they'd be applied basically based on you know, what type of contamination was where. Um, and that's on page 10 of your book. So there are those two big tables. So it really sort of leads to the question, you know, how many cleanup options are there? We've, uh, we've heard some discussion of, well, there's, there are three plausible options. Well, it's, it's, it's far more than that. And, uh, you know, we have what I just said, 10 sediment alternatives, nine floodplain alternatives, and five treatment storage and disposal alternatives. So we tried to put together a little math. If you think about those two matrices overlaid with the uh, potential combination between the two, uh, and then add in the, the different options for treatment or disposal, uh, we're up to about 4,200 different combinations of, of cleanup alternatives all still on the table, all still being evaluated. Um, now, if you try to simplify 4,200 options, a lot of them fit, as far as sediment goes, um, most of them fit into these general categories, and I'm going to try to run through examples of, of, uh, of each of these to try to give you a better flavor for it. No action, which we're basically required to look at as well, what, what would happen if you didn't do anything at all? Uh, the next one, and uh, uh, Mike Palermo talked about this, monitored natural recovery. Uh, he talked about actually most of these. Uh, the next two, removal with capping, removal with backfill. Uh, in the CMS, they use the terminology removal. Um, a lot of Mike's 
discussion centered on the term dredging. Um, you know, really, it's just we, there's no necessarily any judgment of how it would be removed, but there's many removal alternatives as far as getting sediment out of the river. Uh, thin layer capping, which I'll show you a, an example of, um, is really sometimes I refer to it as enhanced monitored natural recovery um, to basically uh, speed the process of natural recovery by adding sort of additional sediments um, to really as a dilution method to sort of speed what might happen naturally, and I'll get into that in a second. Uh, engineered capping uh, is is what it says again, you know, sort of a a a, a more sort of stable layer, one that's not really expected to sort of mix with the underlying sediment. Uh, and many of the alternatives, if, if you look at that table, uh, have a sort of a line item down, down one whole column, bank stabilization. We heard a lot about the banks and their you know, potential instability in some areas. Um, and so these alternatives look at ways to sort of, you know, ways to deal with that. So we're going to look at an example here. Uh, we took the middle of the table here. This is uh, said five, the, the, the fifth sediment alternative. And as I said, it, it, uh, it's basically broken down, reach 5A, 5B, 5C. That, that's basically from the, all of reach five is from uh, Fred Garner Park from the confluence um, down to Woods Pond. Um, but that's broken up into 5A, 5B, 5C, the, and the banks. And then we have further downstream Woods Pond uh, reach 7 is basically the river between Woods Pond and uh, Rising Pond. Reach 8 is Rising Pond. Reach 9 through 16 is basically from Rising Pond down through Connecticut. So here's an example of where you saw a lot of those terms um, and how they might, they all they apply to this, to this alternative. So for Reach 5A and 5B, the alternative looks at removal of two feet of sediment and then basically replacement of material as a, as a cap over any residual contamination that might be there. As I mentioned, the banks, uh, we looked at stabilization and potentially some so removal of soil from the banks. Uh, this is where we get into these 4,200 alternatives is reach 5C, combination of two foot removal with capping, just like A and B, um, having trouble aiming here. Uh, that's in the shallow areas and then maybe just capping in deeper areas. Uh, similarly, in the backwater areas of reach five, thin layer capping and monitor natural recovery. So kind of a monitor natural recovery here with, with an enhancement of thin layer capping, uh, removal with capping, capping, monitor natural recovery. You've seen that term before, MNR. Uh, so th that's one alternative. It obviously involves a number of different approaches within that same alternative um, and even within you know, smaller areas of the river. So let's talk about monitoring natural recovery. Uh, just, just to sort of, I guess, reiterate what, uh, uh, what Dr. Palermo said. Um, basically, uh, you know, the heart of it is monitoring program of various environmental media sediments, surface water, uh, you know, organisms, et cetera, uh, and coupled with institutional controls. So in this case, it might be the continued fish advisories or other sort of advisories. We would, we would use that term, institutional controls. When you talk about Thin layer capping, and remember that other term, I think you started on one of the other sites, EMNR, Enhanced Monitor Natural Recovery. Really, uh, this graphic's trying to contemplate, you, you, basically an addition of a, a thin, probably sand layer that's, that's not really meant to be a barrier, but is allowed to mix with the underlying sediment and sort of speed the process of what might be sort of natural sedimentation, natural capping. Um, typically, not suitable for sort of the, you know, more rapid running reaches of the river, more for sort of impounded areas. Um, that's where we've seen that remedy selected at other sites. Um, so many of the alternatives involve sediment removal from the riverbed and banks. And a lot of those alternatives, if you saw them, how they were written, don't necessarily talk about, again, the sort of dredging method. Susan's going to get into some of, you know, sort of how some some uh, remediation might be approached. Um, but let's talk about river banks because that really uh, follows on what Keith was talking about earlier tonight as far as various ways to stabilize the uh, river banks. Um, this is really, you know, I, I, if any uh, remedy was selected that involved uh, river bank stabilization, I think it's really sort of a highly uh, uh, tailored approach to a particular spot in the river uh, and is really specific to the morphology in the river um, in those areas as far as 
you know, what are we trying to sort of protect here on the bank? So this is, uh, this is just sort of a typical kind of armor stone or riprap uh, bank stabilization. A, sort of a, a, an enhancement to that that, uh, that that could be looked at is sort of an, an additional uh, sort of vegetative kind of habitat layer on top of that so that uh, if you still needed sort of a stone armoring, um, you still, you, you, uh, you minimize any adverse effects that might have by, by uh, trying to add another layer on top. All of these alternatives, the way you see them here is we're showing uh, excavation and backfill of the, of the sediment underneath it just as, a, as an illustration. Uh, and then another is you know, sort of, a, I guess, the, the, the next evolution of that um, that we're looking into more seriously is, is uh, the concept of bioengineering. Um, again, so this involves the sediment removal here, but using other natural materials, especially sort of below the water line. You know, you see this is a little illustration of a, of a you know, sort of a, a log, a tree, um, using other natural materials and really creating a, a a stable bank um, that's that is is uh, working with the river processes. So again, it's sort of I guess looking at the morphology that you've heard about the last few days. Uh, where is the river? Where's the river sort of wanting to go? And uh, uh, you know, how can we sort of work with it and not uh, not against it? So then we get to floodplains, which um, f for us when we do you know eastern part of the state, we a lot of just sort of soil remediation jobs and the, the floodplain soil is a little more sort of standard, uh, somewhat easier to, to, to comprehend for me anyway, perhaps not for you, but uh, is numerical standards set up for the protection of human health and the environment. And we heard from Donner Voorhees yesterday about sort of EPA's risk range of one in 10,000 to one in a million risk. So cleanup levels would be established that basically represent those risks. Uh, represents sort of being protective so you get to a point where it's an acceptable risk. Uh, also looking at a non-cancer hazard, same thing, sort of tr picking a cleanup level that is sort of protective of human health or similarly cleanup levels that are protective of uh, ecological risks um, or other PCB concentration based limits. So in the corrective measures study in that table that you have in your book, you'll just see some places where it says, uh, you know, basically excavation of everything over 25 parts per million PCB. And that was one of the alternatives that was evaluated. Um, so this is just a, I guess, simple schematic of, of what uh, floodplain remediation might be. So in that table, it might say, you know, uh, removal of top foot of sediment that exceeds a particular cleanup level. Uh, so, you know, this is basically excavation of, of uh, 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 floodplain soil uh, and then restoration of the area. Uh, so those were really looked at separately, the, the sediment alternatives and the floodplain alternatives in those tables. Um, in, the, in this revised CMS, um, GE also looked at a series of combined alternatives to sort of look at the kind of the how, how particular alternatives uh, for sediment and soil might be uh, cleaned up, you know, in conjunction with each other. So that's really, you know, sort of combined infrastructure if, if uh, there's required sort of a road and a staging area to uh, excavate uh, a floodplain area um, and, there, and you also need to work in the sediment, um, looking at how those sort of work together that you can sort of, you know, minimize those impacts and obviously you're not building two roads to the, to the same place. Um, so this is, this is not an exhaustive list, they, they just, and I'm not going to sort of go through them, those are, um, the, I think the volumes and costs are also in your, in your book for these various uh, uh, combination alternatives, um, but again, just because these combinations were looked at doesn't mean any of the alternatives that, that weren't in those combinations uh, aren't still on the table. Again, they're, they're, uh, they're, still, they're still on there and they're still part of the evaluation. So here's an uh, example of a combination alternative, you know, in any sort of uh, particular stretch of the river. Um, you might have an area where you have an uh, area of floodplain soil that you believe re um, that requires remediation. Uh, in that same area, you may be removing the set two, two feet of sediment, say, uh, from, the, from the base of the river and doing some type of, of uh, riverbank stabilization. Um, then the next layer is really the treatment and disposal options, and that looks at 
if one were to select any type of uh, active remedy that involved the excavation of soil or sediment, what would you do with the resultant material? So there were five options looked at in the, uh, in the CMS. Uh, they were, two of them were disposal in a landfill, one of those was an on-site facility, excuse me, one was an off-site facility, and another one was what we consider an on-site local disposal facility, and uh, as many of you know, GE's study identified three potential locations um, for, those, for, those, for that facility. Um, another disposal option that um, hasn't been talked about a lot but was evaluated in the, in the CMS um, was disposal in what's called a confined disposal facility, a CDF. And that um, would typically involve sort of an area essentially within the, in the river, um, for sake of illustration, maybe say one of the backwater areas that could be cordoned off, basically cut off from the river, uh, contaminated sediment would be placed in there and then covered over. So sort of a kind of a landfill within the river. So that was part of the uh, one of the value, one of the options evaluated. Um, and then, then there are two um, treatment alternatives evaluated. Chemical extraction, which basically uses a chemical to try to uh, remove the PCBs from the sediment, basically reducing the concentration of the sediment, uh, and thermal desorption, which basically uses heat to sort of uh, remove the, uh, the contamination from the sediment. Both of those result in some type of concentrated liquid waste that has to be typically shipped off site for incineration. Um, and then the, th that treatment is typically then followed by disposal of that clean sediment unless some type of re reuse option was find, found. So uh, these technologies would be successful in reducing the PCB concentration in, in a material, uh, but it might not reduce it to a level that it could be sort of put back in the river uh, or used elsewhere, so then that also may have to be disposed. Uh, so, th so that was also evaluated in the, uh, in the study. Um, it's important to note all of those Techno those two technologies are what we would call ex situ technologies, and we talked about that. I'm losing track of my days now. I don't know if that was uh, yesterday or if it was Tuesday. Uh, ex situ technologies, that is, both of those technologies would involve uh, building a treatment plant and, and bringing, transporting those materials to that treatment plant for, for this ex situ treatment. Um, uh, Innovative technologies and, uh, that deal with materials in situ, sort of the, the whole concept that we've talked about in the past of is there something that could be added to the sediment that would, that would basically reduce the contamination um, in varying stages of development. So at this point, I think we heard from, uh, from Dr. Palermo, you know, nothing that we're aware of right now that's sort of that, uh, uh, implementable at, at, at a large scale at this point, um, but you know, we, we will be looking for um, future opportunities to, to test any emerging technologies in the near term and in the long term. And uh, Susan's gonna talk about adaptive management, there's that term again, but you know, we'd like to, in any cleanup plan we might come up with, I think we'd like to work in some type of process for, for exploring uh, you know, new and better ways of, of doing whatever it is we, we, uh, we feel needs to be done out there. Uh, so, let me talk about making the cleanup decision. Um, this is maybe the third or fourth time now you've seen these permit standards. Um, these are in the, basically in GE's permit that is governing this cleanup. That permit is part of the consent decree that, that really governs the, uh, the, entire, uh, the entire site. Um, these are really the metrics we're using to evaluate those alternatives individually against how they meet these criteria and comparing alternatives, sort of, you know, sort of, uh, comparing which ones do certain things better. So, but it really starts with these uh, general standards, which I sometimes refer to as like threshold criteria. And number one is overall protection of human health and the environment. Uh, number two is control sources of releases. So, you know, we need to look at, and we use the model for this a lot, is looking at whatever you might do in an upstream reach, how that impacts downstream areas. Obviously, the goal of anything is to make sure that you're controlling any further contamination downstream. Uh, and compliance with applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements, ARARs, basically 
uh, environmental laws and regulations that might uh, uh, govern the cleanup. So the Clean Water Act, uh, the TOSCA, the Toxic Substance Control Act, which is the, the PCB rules. Uh, then you get into the selection decision factors, uh, which I would refer to as kind of balancing criteria in sort of looking at uh, how each alternative uh, meets each of these criteria. Long-term reliability and effectiveness, attainment of those IMPGs, the, the cleanup goals, uh, reduction, how, how an alternative re uh, reduces toxicity, mobility, or volume of contamination, its short-term effectiveness, its implementability, can it be done, and its cost. So let's talk about how EPA selects a remedy. Um, this is really the, a big step in that process as we sort of really try to uh, gauge you know, your thoughts on, on, the, on the cleanup. Um, we do have to go through a series of internal reviews before we're able to get to a point where we can come back here and talk to you about what we think our preferred cleanup approach is. And so a big step in that is this National Remedy Review Board, which really is sort of an EPA internal peer review process, uh, a group of basically uh, uh, our counterparts from across the country and in our Washington office, uh, making sure that, that we're making sound remedy decisions and that we're being consistent across the nation in how we address uh, uh, cleanups. Uh, once we get through that, we'll basically be proposing out what we think uh, is the best approach for cleanup to the public for, for your input. Uh, and that, as part of this process, will actually include a draft revision to this permit that GE has that, that, that would uh, govern the cleanup. Um, the comment period would be a minimum of 45 days. Um, we'll have additional public meetings, and there'll actually be formal hearings where people can make formal, you know, sort of read testimony. Um, as, and we'll have to collect all those comments, address those comments as we move towards trying to make a final cleanup decision. Uh, so, this this week of mini workshops was really to help everybody kind of get up to speed and remember all of the work that's really been done over the past decade as far as the, the past investigations and, and risk assessment studies um, and, and really hopefully give everyone a good, good uh, basis for moving towards the May 7th charrette uh, where we can help uh, you know, get your views and, and, uh, uh, about the cleanup and we'll talk about it at the end of the night maybe some of the um, some of the thoughts on how, well, what we might talk about there, but you know, help you think about our criteria that we've laid out there as far as what we have to judge the cleanup against, um, but also talk about other, other factors that you find important. Uh, and again, the material for those workshops, uh, for all of these events are on that Housatonic web, uh, excuse me, HousatonicWorkshops.org site. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. A few questions. In the stretch of Housatonic River already restored, riprap was used to stabilize banks. Do you anticipate any stretches of the rest of the river using riprap for stabilization purposes? Okay. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the challenges in the, in the first two miles of the river were really what we've talked about in the past, uh, Keith and other speakers, of a uh, 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 highly developed area with the often sort of steep banks uh, and, you know, in many cases, buildings and homes sort of right up, right up against the river. So, uh, you know, that certainly influenced the, the kind of the, the reconstruction uh, methods. Uh, the river, as you know, gets very different as you move further downstream. Uh, so I really think it, it, it kind of depends. Uh, it depends on where you are. And we talked about the sort of, you know, considering the morphology, considering about, um, the, the real the behavior of, of the river in that particular uh, area. But as you saw, I had three examples up there. One of them, we had that stone armoring, which is, you know, is basically a, a riprap material. So uh, it, it certainly may be in the mix in any type of bank restoration. But I think it, it's, it's it, if and when we get to that point, it's really going to have to be a uh, uh, sort of you know, location by location consideration. Susan's going to get into a little more of that in the next session as well. Okay. 
Even though the question was asked before, is it EPA who does post-restoration monitoring with GE funding the mo this monitoring? Uh, well, the, uh, the consent decree does require GE to implement the, the, the selected remedy, whatever we end up here as the, as the selected remedy, and we would consider the monitoring to be part of that. Uh, part of that process, but as it, it, I can use examples from other sites, you know, in other parts of the state, uh, in in many cases, you know, when the PRP, as we'll call it, the responsible party, uh, is is doing some of that long-term monitoring, EPA is still on the job overseeing it, and we certainly have the opportunity if we found it necessary to um, to do additional monitoring ourselves as well. Is GE going to monitor? GE that? would be required to, if they're required to, to implement the remedy, they would be required to maintain the remedy, which will involve taking samples under our direction. How does EPA view newer, innovative bioremediation techniques for PCBs? Skepticism, enthusiasm, curiosity. Particularly, is EPA willing to include this technique in C2 methods at least on a trial basis. In such a large and costly project, it would seem that cutting edge technology serious should be, should be welcomed, even if it would mean more time is needed to evaluate its results. Yeah, I think we've touched on this a few times and, and then we can talk about it further. Um, Again, we, we don't know of a technology right now that would be ready to be implemented at, at, a, at a scale we'd be talking about here as far as an in-situ method. Um, but we definitely don't want to close the books on, you know, new good ideas that come up over time. Any cleanup here, if it is a, a lengthy process, uh, you know, would be, uh, we would have an opportunity to adapt as, as we went down. And, and uh, no one's going to ignore a, a, a great idea that comes up if, if a new technology, you know, comes on the scene in, in five years, ten years, whatever. Um, you know, we'd be crazy not to consider it. In the floodplain area, the excavation slide presented earlier, were the trees present excavated around or were they removed? In the, cases where the, the trees are removed in the floodplain area, what have, what have been restoration practices on river sites? Well, uh, let me go here. I was just trying to look for the example. I think people were asking about the, the example there where we showed sort of an area. Uh, there was a tree in the middle of that right. hole. That tree would have to go. Uh, there will be, uh, we can't say that if there was a, uh, you know, floodplain remediation that was in an area that had trees in it, that, you know, there would be some, some clearing of trees. I think what we've tried to uh, explain over the last few days is, uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean forever. You know, there will be a, there, any kind of cleanup would require re reconstruction and, and restoration, and you can't replace a, a 50 year old tree right away, uh, but there, you know, there would have to be a replanting program, and we've, and again, we've tried to show over the last few days uh, how, how systems like this can recover. Okay. One last question for now. Uh, Bob, you mentioned parts per million but the tables in page 9 and 10 are in milligrams and kilograms. Please help us convert milligrams, kilograms to parts per million. One to one. <laughs> I apologize for that, yes. Uh, milligrams per kilogram is a, is a weight-based method. Parts per million is really sort of one grain out of a million grains, if you will, sort of in a, in a uh, if, you had a, if you had a million marbles and one Part per million PCB, that's one marble in a, in a bucket of a million marbles. One part per million. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. We'll try to get to the rest of the questions for the panel. For the panel. <laughs> our, our next speaker is Susan Seversky. Susan's the EPA project manager for the rest of River. Many of you know Susan and have worked with her for years. Uh, Ms. Seversky has worked for the EPA over 30 years in many different capacities. She graduated with a degree in wildlife ecology from the University of Maine and subsequently worked for Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife.
She began her career in, at the EPA in Water Quality Monitoring Program in Washington, D.C. Susan has taught sessions on ecological risk assessment and restoration of contaminated sediment sites and has authored numerous technical papers on these issues as well as those associated with the rest of the river. Susan Seversky. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all so much for being here tonight and for those of you who have stuck with us for the whole three nights. It's just wonderful to see you all here and to be able to share information that we've gathered of all, over all the years. So I really want to give you my heartfelt appreciation for being here. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, we talked about, you know, what potential alternatives might be out there. And in reading all of the public input that I received on the corrective measure study f that was submitted in October, and also in talking with the CERTUS folks about the interviews that they conducted with many of you all over the last few months, it was obvious that there's lots and lots of questions that go beyond the selection of the alternative to how an alternative might be implemented. So rather than leave you all hanging with regard to so many of those questions, I'm going to talk in just a very general sense about the types of principles or concepts that EPA would, try, would envision would be applied to any active alternative. So it's a little bit of a switching of gears. Okay, uh, we've pretty much covered this all. We're in our decision-making process. No decision as to what alternative is the appropriate alternative to meet those nine criteria has yet been made. We obviously are still looking to you all for your input in, through, you know, through this process and your questions and the charrette and um, going forward. We, um, but if we, as I just said, if we did select an active remedy, what type of principles would we want applied to the implementation of that remedy going forward? Well, what does this mean? Any cleanup of the river, sediments, banks, floodplain soils should first be done in a carefully planned and thoughtful manner considering first off the PCB contamination and risk reduction issues. Secondly, the river processes that we've heard about over the last couple of days. The species and habitats of great concern to us all, as well as cultural resources, which while they were touched upon on Tuesday morning by, or Tuesday after, not evening, you can, I probably saw the presentations three times Tuesday, so I'm confused, um, by Rich Donito. Um, we, we have cultural resources in this area that we might have to be concerned about during any active remediation. Um, downstream impacts of a remediation and quality of life issues for those in the area of a remediation. Any active remedy, in EPA's opinion, would have to be implemented with a surgical mindset. I'll explain what that is in a few slides. We would ensure that restoration is an integral component that goes hand in hand with the design of any remedy. They can't be done in a vacuum. They can't be done separately. They have to be done in concert with one another. So it's an integrated process. Provide the ability to improve and adapt as we go on. Bob alluded to that, and I will speak a little bit more to that. And lastly, continue to take stakeholder input through the process. We can't do it alone. We'd have to do it with you if we were to do anything at all. Okay, just basically recapping from primarily yesterday, PCBs in the Housatonic River are posing a real risk to human health and harm to animals in the floodplain and the river system. We've demonstrated that through our peer-reviewed risk assessments. I welcome you to, if you weren't here last night, look to that website that Bob just posted. All the presentations are going to be there, and you can get a quick crash course in what's contained in the feet of document with regard to the risk assessments. And according to the analyses that GE had performed and included in the corrective measures study, in many cases, 
They projected out model results and were able to demonstrate that the PCBs are not going anywhere or being buried to any extent for the foreseeable future in most cases. And in their cases, in, in, in the case of the corrective measures study, they only went out to say greater than 250 years. Okay, river processes. The river channel, as we heard on Tuesday, has been altered by numerous activities on the part of man over the last couple of centuries, and it has not recovered. We have a lot of evidence for that, which uh, we, we discussed on Tuesday, of channel straightening, relocation, uh, lo loss of some connection to the floodplain in certain locations, the clearing of the floodplain, um, and that all of that in the watershed alterations, altering the sediment load in the system, which then creates a response by the river to that altered sediment load. So that means, as Keith has, has eloquently said, we have to work with the river if we are to do any active remedy. We can't work against it. And Mark Fallou yesterday had a very cute cartoon of the river coming up to bite an arrogant engineer until he decided that he needed to befriend the river and the river then befriended him. Okay, species of concern to all of us. We know there are species out in the floodplain and a couple in the river that are of special concern at the state or federal level. Any cleanup has to, has to look at opportunities to avoid first next minimize, and lastly, if necessary, mitigate for the impacts to these species. And Keith spoke a little bit to methods that can be used to do those things. Again, let's not forget our cultural resources. We have a need to research, if there's an active remedy, research and implement a program to take place during that remedy to document and or preserve cultural resources such as Native American artifacts or whatever might be encountered during that active remedy. Um, over on the Hudson, for example, they actually, right here, um, in the mile and a half, they ran into one of the oldest, I think it is the oldest dam that was on the river system and they were able to document that. Downstream impacts. Well, we were able to show you that the majority of the PCB contamination occurs in the 30 miles downstream from the confluence. The PCBs are still moving downstream. They don't just exist in those 30 miles. And they continue, and will continue to have adverse impacts downstream, including, for example, the fish consumption advisories and waterfowl consumption advisories in Massachusetts and the fish advisory that continues down into Connecticut. Concerns that folks have regarding sediment management issues for activities such as dam maintenance or removal, maintenance of bridge uh, integrity, et cetera, and the additional costs and burdens that are associated with that because of the presence of PCBs. And another example is the, the degraded water quality. Um, in Connecticut, for example, the river is on their uh, Clean Water Act formal, quote, impaired waters list, unquote, due to the PCBs from upstream in Pittsfield. And there are also numerous exceedances of ambient water quality criteria in Massachusetts as well for PCBs. Lastly, referring back to what Dr. Palermo was saying about resuspension. Resuspension happens if you do an active remedy using most of the techniques that both he and Bob discussed. However, it can be managed and it should be managed in a way that only short-term and or transient impacts should occur downstream from that resuspension. Quality of life. Quality of life is important to us. It's not all about the animals, it's about us too, about you guys. And we believe that any active alternative would have to address and minimize the impacts to quality of life, such as the hours of operation, 
that might, uh, um, activities might occur during. I'm just, these are examples. Uh, any lighting that is used during the activities, sound control, dust controls, etc. It also means that cleanup, well, act, act, any active cleanup also has to have an infrastructure associated with it. Roads, staging areas, etc., traffic. So there would have to be efforts to optimize the impacts from that infrastructure and that traffic to residents, public road systems, traffic patterns, et cetera. Next, we, had, we would have to provide during any act of remedy a easy mechanism for stakeholders to interact with us about concerns that they have the, about the remedies implementation and any adverse effects that they might be experiencing that we could mitigate. And lastly, Providing for ways to allow continued recreational opportunities during the remediation. The remediation um, will go from up, if it was to take place, would occur from upstream to downstream in small segments at any given time. And with some creative thinking and working with stakeholders, we should be able to come up with ways to allow for continued recreational opportunities during a multi-year cleanup. A surgical mindset. Well, any river cleanup is like a surgery. I've been involved in a number of them. It's necessary, perhaps, to address the disease. It's painful when it occurs, yet things heal with time. My example is I've had two knee replacements, and my preference is that that surgeon not go in with a sawzall if he can use a laser. Luckily, he did the latter. Cleaning, um, cleanup infrastructure and equipment should be designed in any active remedy to have the smallest possible footprint using the best available technology and thoughtful layout of access roads, staging areas, etc. That can be done with a lot of good thought and consideration of areas for remediation and overlap and minimization of areas that don't have to be impacted. There's the thought that perhaps in the implementation of any active alternative, some consideration should be given to perhaps leaving an area of contamination that if you were to sort of just sort of blindly look at it and say, oh, that's a very contaminated area compared to over here, but it takes you acres of infrastructure to get there, that maybe we could let that be and go over here, maybe do a little more remediation to reach whatever that cleanup goal is and have a lesser footprint and have the same resultant risk reduction results. And lastly, minimize the amount of time that any given area is affected confining work to small areas at a given time, moving from upstream to downstream. For example, in Keith's presentation, providing the opportunity then for adjacent habitat and animals in that habitat to coexist while a remediation is going on perhaps next door and then recolonize as an example. Restoration, again, I'm going to reiterate this because this is near and dear to my heart almost as much as Keith's. It has to be done hand in glove with any remedial design if we were to do an active remedy. It has to be the goals of that, re uh, that restoration, as Keith alluded to, need to be developed with stakeholder input. We all have to come up with a common vision or as close as we can to a common vision of what we want to see the river look like at the end. The activities need to be overseen by professionals. You can't just go out there and just, you know, have your normal um, person who might do a great job at operating a backhoe operating in a vacuum without some restoration specialist working with them to make sure that they're doing the best job possible to make that restoration work well. 
take advantage of opportunities that this might present um, during the cleanup. Opportunities perhaps to uh, provide access where there is no access, if that's a desired outcome by the public, as an example. Um, and it's restoration itself is not one size fits all. Uh, we have a lot of different habitat types out there. Jordan Lordy, I think, did a great job showing some of the mapping that's been done and the ecological characterization over the years of the many different habitat types that exist in Rest of River. Different restoration techniques need to be applied for the appropriate habitat types and on a micro scale, not on a macro scale. Restoration goals and time frames are very important and they have to not only be developed but they also have to be clearly presented and communicated and most, uh, most importantly understood, particularly the time frames issue. Um, as Bob said, you can't replace a 50 year old tree but we can all understand where on the trajectory we are setting a habitat if we do an act of restoration and what that will result in and when and we need to have that conversation. And lastly, monitoring of restoration is an essential component of the entire process. Adaptive management. Everybody's talking about adaptive management. I was in New Orleans and there's a presentation on adaptive management. Um, not one presentation, an entire platform. I don't know how many speakers were in it. I think everybody had a different definition. Um, to me, what it means is it's common sense. It's how you do a project right. And there's not a lot more magic to it than that. And what I mean by, you know, doing it right, common sense, any active cleanup will take some number of years. That provides a lot of opportunities to learn and grow and change, as we should. So the des any design could be staged in a manner such that it allows for a critical review by the project team, in this case perhaps GE and EPA and stakeholders, to review the work that was performed while work is still ongoing to be able to inform the design of the next stretch. And this, that's just common sense. That's good project management. Lastly, in this case, it will also allow for opportunities if we get new equipment, you know, Dr. Palermo showed us some nifty, nifty, you know, machines. I've actually seen some, been on some. They're pretty cool. They've got, I'm going to do a quick sidebar. They've got really, really neat GPS capabilities. So, you know, you could program them in ahead of time and you could say, I want to get to here in the sediment bed. And they're going to get to there plus or minus like that. It's very, very cool. But those technologies are going to continue to improve. So we should be able to take advantage of that. And also, maybe some new innovative technologies, in situ technologies or ex situ technologies may come along. And if they have viable and they've got promise, we need to be able to have the opportunity to take a serious look at them. And if they work, work them into our program. So to me, adaptive management, common sense, good project management, learn and have a continual feedback loop to your program. Okay, in summary, um, we recognize that if any active remedy is selected or proposed by us and ultimately selected, with the proper planning, management, and stakeholder involvement, we can be successful in our implementation such that there'll be permanent reductions to risks to humans in the environment, permanent reductions to downstream transport, continued downstream transport of PCBs, a river and a floodplain that over time will regain its beauty, its ecosystem functions and values, its uses for us, you all, for recreational opportunities, as long as an active restoration program is put in place that puts it on the right trajectory. trajectory. And that no long-term loss of species and perhaps improvement in the habitat quality and numbers and occurrences of rare species, for example, could be a component of a successful, successfully implemented active remediation strategy along with restoration. And with that, 
I'll take any questions. Thank you, Susan. The HHRA shows that consumption of fish is such a high risk that consumption advisory signs posted in Massachusetts show a fish on a plate with a big X, meaning do not eat. Why are the fish consumption signs in Connecticut small in size and convoluted in wording? Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, Susan Peterson, or uh, one of her colleagues, Tracy Ayotte, from the state of Connecticut, isn't here tonight. Uh, it's because the state regulated the design of those signs, and I think it even, this was before my time, I think it might have even gone up to the governor and um, I'm not quite sure. But those signs were a explicit design by the state of Connecticut. Okay. The section of the river from Woods Pond south has historically been an integral part of the economies of Lennox and Lee. Is the reme remediation of the economic assets part of overall strategic thinking that will go into the final plan? It's certainly of concern. And I should have added in quality of life economics, um, both positive economics and negative economics. There's benefits from the addition of jobs, potentially, from remedy, remediation and restoration to the economy, as well as potential downsides if there's a perception that um, it's a negative in its implementation. But definitely the concerns um, downstream, I know Lee and Lennox are trying to have areas that have some mills that have been abandoned, et cetera. Um, rebound and it's a concern that we have and we'll be trying to factor into our thought process. Okay, thank you. Please expe explain the consent decree, initiation <laughs> process, and ruling requirements, including but not limited to the CMS, in uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. 30, it's impossible in 30 seconds. Um, certainly, I think one of us uh, would be more than willing to talk with whoever gave us that comment um, afterwards. I particularly suggest that Tim Conway, our attorney, our counsel, be the person they talk to. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we looking at GE's summary of alternatives? Doesn't the EPA have its own summary? For instance, how deep some removal has to be? For instance, how deep does some removal has to be? Um, we're evaluating GE's summary of alternatives, and actually not just their summary, all of their alternatives and their detailed analysis, and we're performing our own. And we may come up with something that's different, or that's a permutation, or maybe it would be one of them, or maybe it would be none of them, or maybe it would be no remediation. But we are in that process. The door is not closed and solely to exactly what is written in the CMS. Okay. In Wednesday's risk assess assessment presentation, it was declared that the reaches of the river at the Mass Connecticut border displayed negligible human risks. How is it then that Connecticut lists the river as an impaired wa waterway? Okay. Um, that's a very good question. Um, actually, they're all good questions. Uh, because it doesn't meet water quality standards, and the impaired waters designation is part of the Clean Water Act, and it's with regard to water quality designated uses and the achieve attainment of those, as well as water quality standards. That it does not equate one-to-one -one with risk, the risk assessment and its um, construct. So there, there are two different programs, and that's a regulatory designation under the Clean Water Act. Okay. One last question for now. When, when in reaches 9 through 16, example for the rest of the river, the active remedy suggested is monitor natural recovery, how can that be called a cleanup, considering the persistence of PCBs? Good question. Um, one thing. I, we were remiss in sticking in Bob's presentation. Um, 
was the map of the concentration gradient going downstream. And what happens is after you get by rising pond, the concentrations drop very dramatically to virtually almost all non-detect. And you can't go clean up what you can't find. So that's why monitored natural recovery is down there. The fish are still contaminated because of if you remember Dick McGrath's presentation about bioaccumulation, biomagnification, you are what you eat. As, the, as a fish eats, a, or as a little fish eats a macroinvertebrate, and then a big fish eats a little fish, all the PCBs end up in that big fish. So it only takes a tiny bit of PCBs that perhaps we can't even measure to have the concentrations in the fish be measurable and unacceptable. So. It's, it's, that might be a little hard to understand. I'll, I'll, I'm willing to talk to anybody about that concept. But in fact, most of the concentrations down in those reaches are extremely low or non-detect. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, could I just say one more thing? Yeah. Um, it's my only chance to say this. Um, in the past, myself or other members of the team have been available to meet with folks. Uh, one on one with your organizations or whatever to talk with you about any questions you have, concerns you have, etc. So I just want to say that today's work or the workshops this week and the charrette are not the end. Give Jim a call, give me a call, shoot us an email, and we can set something up as we've done in the past to come and sit down with y'all and talk about whatever issues are on your mind. So it doesn't just end on May 7th. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Before we bring out the panel, I, I wanted to ask my colleague, Kathy Poole, uh, who is the charrette coordinator, uh, also known, known as the charrette queen, to come out and say a few words about the charrette with a special guest. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Really, really appreciate it. Hear ye, hear ye. On behalf of the APA, Shakespeare and Company cordially invite you to attend the Housatonic Rest of River Public Charette at Shakespeare's Elaine Bernstein Theatre on Saturday, May 7th from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. The Charette is, it is a very unique opportunity to learn about the alternatives, the mandatory criteria you keep hearing about the EPA must follow, and the potential cleanup options. Uh, the Charette's also an opportunity for the public to offer very direct, sorry, very direct, anyway, <laughs> very direct, direct and very practical, direct and practical input on all the options that the EPA might pursue. Um, the Charette is an all-day event, and it's filled with multiple and varied activities. There is something for everyone. So basically, the more you engage, the more opportunities, the, well, the more activities you participate in, the more opportunities you're going to have to give your input. It is very important that you register for the Charette using the blue forms in your packet or by going online at www.hootatonicworkshops.org. We look forward to seeing you at the charrette. Okay, thank you, David. Sorry, thank you, David Joseph. He's an actor here at Shakespeare and Company. He also happens to be the event coordinator and the person we've been running ragged all week. Um, it is true that I am the self-appointed charrette queen. Uh, because I'm basically in charge of uh, designing all the activities and the day and to make sure everybody gets their chance um, on that day. Um, and David's in my sh little Shakespeare moment, um, we call it, is to underscore that charrettes are supposed to have some fun in them. Um, they're exciting, they're engaging. It's all about being engaged and, um, and they're dynamic. And so they're really great fun. 
Uh, I promise I will not make you sit for three hours in one chair. Uh, that's definitely, it's exactly the opposite. Where these mini workshops have been all about giving information to you and you're absorbing it and trying to deal with it and what in the heck is 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 8, you know, and your head exploding. Um, the charrette is about now what do you do with it? How do we apply this information? How do we, what are we going to do with it in terms of deciding what to do um, with this situation we have here? So um, you'll have the opportunity to view some very cool tools that will help you figure out what you might think the right thing to do is, um, and some tools actually that the EPA will be using and that GE has used in determining their um, ideas about what to do. Um, now, by the same token, I don't want to give the impression that this is a trivial matter. This is really important, as you know. I mean, I wish I could wave my little scepter and make all the PCBs go away. You know, but I, I can't. So you're going to have to work. And, and we're going to go through some very careful processes for, and for you to figure out, well, what are the consequences if I do this? Well, I thought I wanted to do that, but what if I do this? And, and to really figure out what all this is. Uh, my head just swims when I think about all the levels of complexities of this project. So we're going to work through those. And at the end of the day, we are not going to have a solution. I want to make that really clear. That is not the idea. The idea is that we are going to have multiple ideas um, about what to do and be able to compare and contrast and debate those. So that there's a range of options um, that you can offer. And, and most of all, this is about being constructive. It's about being comprehensive. Um, it's about giving constructive feedback to the EPA as they now you know, have to craft this decision. So, um, May 7th, plan to attend all day, please. Um, it will behoove you to register, just trust me on that one. So until then, uh, thank you for your patient listening and your very thoughtful questions, and I look forward to seeing you all May 7th. Thank you, Kathy. So I'm going to um, read a question and um, suggest a speaker and if anyone else wants to join in or respond after that, please feel free. And we don't mind staying late if it takes longer to read all the questions. Uh, Mike, what kinds of uh, improvements have been made in the past 20 to 30 years in dredging technologies? Well, uh, am I live? Yeah. Uh, there have been improvements made, uh, significant improvements made uh, in the last, say, 20 years for environmental dredging as well as dredging that we use for navigation. Uh, to me, one of the biggest improvements relates not so much to hardware, but uh, the ability to position the equipment uh, to do more accurate removal. Uh, you know, in the last 20 years, we've got, you know, like the GPS that you find in your car, using your car, uh, they have them that are a lot more accurate than that. And, you know, that can help you position uh, the removal uh, much more accurately as an example. Also, things like the environmental buckets that I showed a photograph of, those, those have come along in the last uh, 20 years on the environmental side. So uh, there have been, you know, good uh, advances in dredging equipment as well as uh, the ability to manage the dredging projects for purposes of environmental cleanup. Okay, thank you. Keith Bowers mentioned cutting down high embankments as part of restoration. What about kingfishers and bank swallows that, are, that use those banks as nesting habitat? Uh, very important consideration in a restoration project, whether it's kingfishers or bank swallows or other uh, maybe rare, threatened, or endangered species. In the case of kingfishers and bank swallows, if we're working with the channel morphology, we, we recognize that in some cases you do have steep banks, especially on the outsides of those meander bends. And if there are ways of stabilizing those banks but still providing habitat, and there are ways of still providing habitat for those species, they could be integrated in. Typically where you cut down the bank to provide that floodplain access is on the inside of the meander bends. So that still leaves ample opportunity on other places along the river for that habitat to exist. Okay. The questioner says, this is for Tincherillo, when you show floodplain location in an area with trees, that means all the trees come down and out first, right? 
Is showing the trees misleading? Where in the criteria do you deal with damage caused by the remediation? So the first question, that means all the trees come down and out first, right? Well, again, as I said earlier, really for any area, I think you know the, the the approach to cleanup really would be tailored to that specific area. One thing I didn't talk about is you know obviously there's a consideration as, as we just mentioned uh, for rare, threatened, and endangered species. So if there was a particular sort of sub area within a floodplain uh, that required special consideration, that one might be approached a little bit differently. Um, and so I think it's really it's it's about tailoring that remediation to the to the specific area and making sure that that uh, that, that uh, you know the remedy and the environment are, are in harmony okay um, for Keith and Susan and whoever else wants to join are you satisfied with the restoration of the Housatonic River in the Fred Garner Park Pittsfield area I am talking about the river itself do you think it can sustain trout, macroinvertebrates? I can answer the second part if you want to answer the first one. Okay, so I think that given what we knew when that occurred, I think the restoration, and given that that's a flood control channel up there, that what was, what was actually implemented was good at the time, but I do think that there were lessons learned that we can certainly apply on other stretches of the Housatonic River. Okay, and I'll speak to the second half of that. Uh, we did do some sampling um, that I was party to after the completion of the mile, of the mile and a half as well as the two miles, uh, or the upper half mile rather. And uh, we sampled transects that had been sampled before remediation for macroinvertebrates. So we had pre-existing data in the presence of PCBs and data following the remediation. We were able to demonstrate a 99% reduction in the body burden concentrations of the macroinvertebrates and an increase in the diversity and the abundance of the macroinvertebrate community as well as the presence of sensitive species that were not there prior to the remediation. So in fact, it was a great success with regard to the macroinvertebrate community. In addition, we sampled the fish community in a qualitative manner to see basically what kind of fish came back. And in fact, we had we were able to identify fish species that returned that were expected to be in that type of river system. Unfortunately, our, um, that river in that area is not really suitable as a cold water fishery and it was not beforehand and, and will not be for a number of different factors, habitat, wa um, water temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a fairly flat area, relatively speaking, um, and trout were not there beforehand. And in any numbers, of course, you're going to maybe see a transient because it is stocked, um, but not as resident or reproducing species. And we did not see them in our qualitative analysis, but we did see the other species assemblages of fish that we would expect for that type of habitat. OK, thank you. Thank you, Michael. This is a long question. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for your good presentation. The community was invited to an information session on sediment remedies. We saw a company with proven field tests of PCB breakdown with simple soil bacteria. We also saw another company present a dredging strategy that had much less footprint than, than the dredgers you showed. The first company, Biotech, got California's EPA to declare highly PCB contaminated land to be open use. Mike, I'm familiar with both of these if you want me to do Yeah, I, I will say on the biotech oh, that I'm... Oh, on. One, one, so let, me, there's, there's one, let me just finish it. <laughs> okay. You, you, <laughs> you, you, are, you are familiar with the Corps of Engineers. Biotech spoke of the Army's resistance to this company because maybe it would up would upend convention, put people out of, <laughs> out of outdated dredging jobs, and force people to change the way they think. How do you feel about this? Well, I'll, I'll say this. First, I've already retired from the Corps, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have a personal stake in that last part of the question, although I'm very loyal to the Corps. I, you know, after 36 years with that agency, I certainly uh, support everything the Corps does. But uh, I will say this, that I'm not familiar with the biotech uh, in detail, and Susan said she could speak to that. And what was the other part on the other technical? Uh, 
I want to let Susan address. Oh yeah, go ahead. Do that first. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm I'm very familiar with the presentations uh, that were made. Uh, Housatonic River Initiative brought biotech in, as well as another company that had it, another technology. Um, Biotech's technology has uh, essentially an enzyme that they essentially a supercharge to be able to break down highly chlorinated compounds. Um, they did demonstrate, or they, they listed a number of sites that they had success in. At those sites, all of the remediation was done ex situ. It was done as if it was a farming operation, where they took the contaminated material, they placed it in a flat area, and they manipulated it with essentially farm equipment to enhance that process of the uh, enzyme's ability to break that material down. Um, we have been in contact with the company. We've met with the president of the company, and we've asked him to provide us with a list of contacts as w uh, for references so I can actually talk to the people in California, for example, um, and also to provide us with the data with regard to their ability to show where the PCBs went, which is mass balance. In fact, so that they you know, in, didn't essentially just volatilize them all, but they actually can account for where they went. And um, other data as well uh, that was associated with the previous projects they've conducted. So we are working with them to investigate it further. Um, to go one step further with that, you might remember that um, they discussed the fact that they are going to be exploring the ability to perform the technology in an in situ fashion by um, uh, distributing via water, like via water cannon. Um, they've never done that before. They are going to be checking it out. Um, we don't have any data from that, but if you hear talk about that, that's what that's related to, and they may be piloting it down in the BP Gulf oil spill. Um, secondly, the uh, second company that presented wasn't a cleanup technology. Um, it was about how to essentially dewater the sediments. And in fact, in the corrective measures study, it's recognized that a remedy that removes sediment from the river um, has to have a dewatering component to it. So that's nothing new. They have a piece of equipment that has a small footprint that includes aspects of dewatering technologies, basically standard things like a trammel, a filter press, a hydrocyclone, et cetera, that's just packaged into one particular unit. So that would be perhaps part of, in remedy, if a remedy were selected in implementation, maybe part of the surgical mindset of p picking equipment that has a small footprint. But other than that, that's really nothing new. The biotech stuff is perhaps something new, and we are in communication with them. Let me, let me follow up on a couple of general comments, too. Just a, some general comments about treatment, especially in situ treatment. Uh, when you have a situation with sediments in place in a water body, and the thickness of contamination is substantial, say, at least a couple of feet even deeper, uh, the problem you have with in situ treatment is that all that usually only works at the surface. And so, you know, with, with a system where events could cause sediment to be moved around, I think I mentioned this during my talk, uh, you'd be, you know, sprinkling pixie dust out there every other month, you know, trying to, you know, do a little bit, chip away a little bit at the, at the problem at the surface, and it's just, it's just not practical. Now, I'm not saying that all in situ remediation is impractical, because we've seen things like, addition of granulated carbon, you know, to a, to a, a layer, uh, maybe a residual layer uh, on the surface that, that, that could do some good. And I'm not saying that no sediment treatment does good because some of it does. A couple of general observations, though. You know, the problem is with any treatment to get the treatment process into contact with the sediment. And that's a big logistical problem for a large area with a very, you know, m hundreds of thousands, say, of cubic yards of, of sediment to deal with. It's just very difficult. Also, as I mentioned, too, once you treat it, like this biotech, once, they, once it would be effective, they still would have to dispose of all the sediment. It'd have to be dredged, it'd have to be disposed of. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to, you know, to spend additional money to treat it when you still got to carry it to a landfill anyway. Okay, we have a lot of questions. Uh, well, so actually, I, 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 this, this is, I think, very important. I saw okay. numerous questions, okay. or I heard numerous questions um, in the public comments, et cetera. So let me, I just want to touch two more points. Uh, first off, Chris from Biotech, when we had our meetings, said it won't work in sediment. 
in situ. He says he does not have a way to deliver it in situ. So what he's proposing is the thought concept of perhaps using the water can application, perhaps in the floodplain soil. Um, one other issue that really didn't come up in his presentation that we had a lot of discussion about and we don't know what the answers are, is he has to apply a lot of nutrients in using that process. And he, and there is some concern about the impact of the addition of a significant amount of nutrients, for example, into the floodplain system and what the effects of that might be if he could get the water cannon application technology to work to get through the duff in the floodplain and actually work on the PCBs, what the nutrient effect might be in the system. So when we talk about you know, things sound really cool and sound really good and when we sit down and, and pick them apart, there are some more issues there to be explored than may seem apparent at initial glance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, is the EPA keeping up with the latest technologies in dredging, especially suction type dredges? Well, you know, I'm not really aware of, of whether there's a formal program to do that. I think that, that certainly people uh, working with EPA and probably people within EPA are trying to keep track of that on an informal basis. I don't know whether they have a you know, some sort of a formal registration process or, or, you know, evaluation process. You know, EPA had programs where they would evaluate technologies. Of course, it called the site program where they did some treatment stuff. Uh, I don't know whether they have something similar for that, but I think it's safe to say that uh, any time new dredging technologies come along, that they're certainly considered, and, and, they're, and believe me, the vendors who make these dredges are going to make it known that they have these, these products out there. So this is why we go to things like the Battelle meetings that yeah. Susan uh, mentioned. We, you know, we, have these, we have these technology groups uh, that have uh, you know, periodic uh, gatherings where we talk about new projects, new approaches, new equipment, and this is how you learn. You know, we're still, all of us are still learning. And so we're, we're okay. keeping track of it. I know I'm keeping track of it as best I can. As am I. Keith, some individuals do not believe vernal pools can be restored once they are dredged. Can you comment? Sure. Well, I think vernal pool restoration is being done all over the country now. And so the idea, again, of looking at sites specifically, looking at the hydrology, which is the most critical factor in these vernal pool um, restoration projects, and how the hydrology works with the stream system and with the groundwater table. Um, and then looking at the soil, looking at woody debris and other characteristics that these vernal pools can be restored to a, 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 a very good state and a very functioning state. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob, what did the EPA learn from the first ha half two mile cleanup um, does EPA plan to apply these lessons to the rest of the river recommendation? I, th I think the, uh, the first two miles and then the mile and a half project that we did specifically, uh, you know, we learned a lot of lessons as, as we went down. It's a good example of sort of how you're adapting your approach to cleanup as, as we proceeded downstream as the, sort of the, the, the challenges of the area changed. Um, we certainly removed a lot of PCBs uh, from the environment through that process um, and through the, the follow-up monitoring we're showing, you know, basically recovery of the, of the organisms in that area as well. Uh, so, as I said before, the environment does sort of really, the, the lay of the land really changes as we, as we move further downstream, but uh, we used several different approaches there, again, between sort of uh, erecting a dam and, and drying out and excavating in the dry, driving sheet pile and doing some excavation, working from within the river, working from a river bank. A lot of those lessons could really inform uh, what, what approach is, uh, is undertaken here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this. This is um, the... The questioner says it's for Susan. Um, I think we're going to come across a number of questions that have been uh, answered, but to let the person who wrote the question know it's being read, but we'll try to move things along. Uh, what do, what's your view of available bacterial bioremediation technologies, for example, Biotech Corp? I think I, I hope I answered that satisfactorily already. Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, how do you factor the damage done by dredging into project risk assessment, and how does the heavy equipment get to the digging location in a wetlands or in other sensitive, area, in other sensitive areas? 
Well, well, the first part of that, uh, I think I mentioned that any area that would be dredged as a part of a remedy, uh, the organisms can, are going to be gone. The, those organisms are going to be gone. Uh, we have found, I think, uh, I'm not a biologist, but I'm just going to relate to you what I've gathered by, you know, exposure to a lot of biologists, I guess you'd say, is that the aquatic environment comes back very quickly and, and recolonizes very effectively. So you would think that any area that would be dredged, if you, you know, especially if you put back a layer uh, for a habitat, for instance, it would recover. So I think it's a, a, it really doesn't enter into the risk assessment because the risk assessment is related to PCBs. You're talking about actual, you know, uh, 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 organisms that will be directly impacted physically, but they'll come back. And hopefully if the river's cleaned up as it should be, when they come back, they won't be contaminated with PCBs. So, so the, the, sec the second part of the question was how does heavy equipment get to the digging location in the wetlands or other sensitive areas? And then Keith could go back to the first part. You think Keith was okay? Well, well, first of all, I think that all you know, any type of remediation that may take place or restoration needs to take place in discrete phases, so that you allow the ecosystem, you give the ability for the ecosystem to recover. So that's extremely important. There are, there is equipment out there that has a very low impact um, in terms of it being able to maneuver and traverse over areas. Um, and so that type of equipment could be used in terms of the dredging operations. And then there's also methods for going back in and reestablishing a healthy soil profile once that equipment is done working in that area or any staging areas are set up there. Okay, and Keith, just to follow up here. Can you walk us through a possible timeline for restoration of Housatonic down to Woods Pond, assuming an aggressive dredging and removal effort? How long does it take to get the river and floodplain to be similar to what it looks like today? Hmm. Um, I, it, it, it would be impossible for me to sit up here and give any kind of specific timeline without knowing what the remedy may be and how it would be phased um, in there. Um, I think it's safe to say that um, any remedy, any act of remedy that may, may occur in the restoration following it would be done in discrete phases and those phases would be hopefully designed in such a way to allow recovery at, at an accelerated rate and to allow for adjacent ecosystems to be sort of the, nurse, the nursery and where recruitment of new plant material and animals could then um, come back in and, and inhabit the site. Recolonize, thank you. Uh, Bob, the um, selection decision standards, do costs simply, do we consider cost to GE or also consider cost to communities, citizens with, of, of the, the alternatives? Uh, the, the cost criterion that, that is laid out in the, uh, in the report is really the construction and sort of operation maintenance and, and long-term monitoring cost. The, the, the impacts to the community, if we sort of use that term cost in that, in that, uh, that sense, uh, is really something that's considered as part of that short-term effectiveness. So sort of the, the, the flip side of the short-term effectiveness is really what are the short-term impacts sort of during construction. So that's really where that, that comes in. Okay, hold, hold the mic. Uh, this question presents a timeline of how they see the events. So after the charrette, general time frame of future events, EPA reviews decision weeks, months, you know, it's hard to put a, a firm timeline on it. I know we've been criticized in the past of saying, oh, you know, here's what we're going to do and here's when we're going to do it. Uh, uh, Kurt Spaulding, our regional administrator, uh, has said on other occasions is uh, we need to take the time to, to get it right to make sure that we're ready to, to propose an alternative. Uh, that said, uh, y y you know, we know this has been a long, drawn-out process and, and uh, we continue to be aiming for the, the fall of this year. Uh, but again, uh, you, you, I don't think you want to rush us to, to, to uh, not coming out with a thoughtful proposal. So um, we really need to take the time we need to take. So that, then the public response is that weeks, months? Well, the, uh, 
Well, we talked about if, when we would propose a remedy, uh, there's a minimum of a 45-day comment period. Uh, if history is our guide, uh, I think we've, <laughs> we, you know, there's probably an extension to the comment period that someone's going to request. Uh, and again, series of public meetings and hearings. Uh, and then, frankly, it depends on the volume and the nature of the comments we get on the proposal uh, that would really influence uh, how quickly we'd be able to render a final decision. And then appeals. Months, years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Susan uh, referred things to our attorney earlier. Maybe I'll I'll do the same. It's really hard to hard to say. Again, there are a series of processes of of appeals for General Electric can appeal, the public can appeal, others can appeal. Uh, so uh, there's it, you, you really can't put a number on those. I wish I could. And, and what's your best guess when it would start and how long <laughs> yeah. to implement? I, I can't. I. Yeah. You want my retirement? Thing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Susan, how will you keep the capping of Silver Lake from recontaminating the cleaned up part of the Housatonic River in Pittsfield? Okay, um, I'll take a shot at this. I have uh, fortunately been able to relinquish my duties for Silver Lake and Uncommit Brook to my esteemed colleague in the back, Dave Dickerson. Um, but I think I can speak to this um, from my past experiences with Silver Lake. Uh, the plan for Silver Lake has a series of controls um, in place to minimize and hopefully eliminate um, the transfer of material from the lake to the river during the process itself through a series of sheet pile curtains and potentially a weir structure. So um, there are controls that are being planned to make, try to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, um, in your presentation, He's, you mentioned institutional controls. What are they? Uh, yes, inst institutional controls uh, usually would be an important part of uh, an MNR component of a remedy uh, and a capping component of the remedy. And the types of controls you would normally consider would be, for instance, uh, limitations on construction that would take place in the water body if you had a cap there. Uh, it could be to related to uh, limitations on the type of boats that could go, you know, and navigate in certain parts of the river. And I'm talking about boats with props, you know, engines, not canoes. I think canoes are good to go. Uh, but, you know, things like that. Uh, 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 also, institutional controls could still be fish advisories until until that problem is, is, is resolved in the long term. So it would be a combination of things, but you would only be you know, required where you have caps in place or MNR as, as remedy components. Okay, the second part of the question. I, yeah, I was just going to follow up on that. I mean, they, you know, I, typically, and it's easier when we talk about soil, you know, the, uh, a typical site, any situation where you have something that's not sort of unrestricted use or unrestricted exposure, that's the type of thing that we have to basically put some kind of system in place to, to safeguard against uh, any of those sort of uh, limited uses, the uses that really aren't done. Another important aspect of institutional controls is to make sure that everyone is aware of, of what's there, you know, uh, so that, you know, uh, somebody can't go out and, you know, they've got the 1-800 call, you know, call before you dig kind of a thing. Same principle applies. Okay, and, and a second part to the question, Mike, is do PCBs break down under caps at a similar or higher rate as they would in the natural setting, or does it stymie that process? Okay. Uh, well, I will say this. I think that the breakdown of PCBs in the sediment environment is very slow, period. Uh, if, if you're looking at, you know, sediment profiles usually have a, a, a surficial layer where it's aerobic. And the breakdown of PCBs would occur faster there. Uh, once you put a cap on top of it, what you've done is you, know, you stop that process, but that process never extends down too deeply anyway. So I would say that the net effect of a cap over PCB contamination would be, you know, very minimal if, if, if negligible. Just as a reminder, um, I believe it was Dick McGrath who addressed the issue of biodegradation of the PCB specifically that we have here in the Housatonic River. The fact that they, it was a process that was studied by GE during the 80s um, and that very little degradation was found to be occurring in just regardless, with or without a cap. So. Remember, just because degradation occurs doesn't mean that risk is reduced necessarily. The, the, the daughter and son products, if you want to call it that, can, can not be good either. 
Keith, can you discuss how the pre-existing ecosystems are reestablished under capping or under dredging? Are there differences? How effective is the restoration? So I think that if you were to undertake some kind of capping situation, whether it's the stream bed or stream banks, um, somewhat like the profile um, that Mike showed up there, that you could have a habitat layer on top of that capping layer, or you could have a t habitat layer um, extending out from any kind of bank capping or bank stabilization. So there are ways of integrating those habitat layers in, in many different forms and many different varieties depending on where you are in the stream or where you are in the floodplain. Okay. Uh, Bob, do any of the caps involve, is it geo, geo fertile materials? Geotextile. Geotextile. Yes. Uh, the answer is no. Okay. And what standards or time frames move on alternative new and in situ cleanup options from no proven ones that we know about to okay, let's fully consider or choose this option? Um, usually they have to go through a bench scale uh, process, which is sort of a test tube or a beaker. Then they go to a pilot scale, which is a um, a, a larger process that perhaps is being done in the environment in which the technology might be considered for a greater application. And then they finally have to meet the implementability criteria. That's one of those criteria that Bob spoke about, which means we have to be able to do it effectively to meet the project goals on a large scale and also address the other criteria, including cost, short-term effectiveness, long-term effectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. So it starts out small and it goes in steps up until it can actually meet the criteria that, are, uh, that Bob discussed. With that, I'm gonna thank the panel for the work that they put in tonight and um, for their presentations. I thank the audience again for the community for coming out, many of you for three nights in a row. Uh, your patience, your questions, your thoughtfulness. Uh, again, what ha wasn't answered will go up on the website. And um, again, we invite you to register for the charrette. We invite you to fill out your blue forms. And we look forward to uh, seeing you on May 7th, if not sooner. Thank you. Thank you.